Jim Carrey doing an impression of that little lady from mm. uh, Poltergeist. Oh my God. Remember? <laughs> He's like, this room is clear. <laughs> We're on, my friend. So before we get started, I want to dedicate this episode to the full refua of a 45-year-old, perfectly health, otherwise perfectly healthy woman who went to the ER. I think ER. I think today, with some kind of unknown issues. Her name would be. Uh, I will tell you in a second. Uh, Esther Razel Basara. So this episode is for her refua. And uh, amen, amen. Esther Razel Basara. Ba Basara, yeah, S Sarah. Esther Razel Basara. Esther Razel Basara. Uh, for the you know, she she took the you know what, and I mean a few months ago, granted, but uh, they they're trying to figure out what the heck this is, and you know, is out the shim. I want to read to you. Are you you there? I am here. I want to read to you a message that I got from one of our listeners, from one of our devout listeners, uh, the, this lady from Germany, who actually, she's not Jewish, but she, men she keeps mentioning to me, she works in a Jewish school, she's a teacher in a Jewish school, and she keeps mentioning to me, and I hope I'm allowed to read this, uh, I'm not going to say the name, <clears throat> but she keeps mentioning to me that she has a proclivity for Judaism, for, you know, davening, and she has a siddur, actually. And she wrote the following this to me uh, yesterday. Hello, dear Tzvi. I was thinking for a while if I should write this, as you might not believe me. Anyhow, I'm a person of clear words, and it's up to you to believe it or not. As you know, I speak from the point of view of a person without official religion, uh, parentheses, yet. I feel that you and, and, Fr and Frank are transmitting energy to the viewers during the podcast. I don't remember exactly when I watched the first video. It was sometime in November. I was looking for some information about Dr. Shmelenko and came to your channel. Somehow it has an effect on my own energy <clears throat> and an effect on relationships with other people. Some people became more friendly, but I also have an example for, for, for somebody who became more distant and less friendly. My colleague at school with whom I had a good relationship, trusting and making fun or like making jokes, et cetera, almost in the direction of a male-female connection, of course, without crossing any lines, just being good colleagues. The colleague is uh, German without connection to Jew Jewish people. And he seems to feel that something has changed, I guess, within her. Then I realized that the religious people, supposedly Lubavitcher, became look, uh, started looking at me in a way that I can't really describe. They look at me, but not really at, at me, not my face, not my eyes. At the same time, I'm sure they are looking at me as if they see something I, didn't, I don't notice. I do not want to ask them, as in general, at work, you need to be careful. I can't ask parents of the school children why they look at me like that, you know, because it's a parent, it's a Jewish parents. Then the thing is the sitter. As you know, I learn praying with the children at school and I want to buy a sitter of my own. I always try to buy my books secondhand and the only sitter available was one that turned out to be a Lubavitcher one. Uh, I guess Tehillat Hashem. As far as I understood, Frank and you are Lubavitcher, that's funny. <laughs> I mean, I guess you are sort of, but I'm, I'm just kind of doing my own thing. I don't know what this all means, but I'm sure that this is an effect from watching your podcast. The effect seems to be stronger when I fall asleep during the podcast. Parentheses, I'm sorry it happens sometimes because we are a few hours ahead. At the moment, I can watch because of the school holidays, but when I work, I need to get up at 5 a.m. It has nothing to do with your podcast, aka, you know, like not like we're boring or anything. Do you have an idea what this all means? Should I ask, also ask Frank, my intuition, it feels positive. What is your opinion about it? Wow. So what was the last question? Like, um, no, some, just uh, what is our opinion about it? Uh, my intuition feels positive. What is your opinion about it? Do you, do you have any idea what it all means? Should I also ask Frank what it means? Well, what does it all mean? You know, dude, once in a while I get these kind of once in a blue moon I get these kind of messages, and I and I sometimes you know otherwise I wonder what what the hell am I doing? You know, if what I'm doing is amounts to anything. Messages, and I, and I sometimes you know otherwise I wonder what what the hell am I? Doing? Is there an echo? There's an echo. It's not an echo. I just open the uh, the, the Facebook. Thing. It's amazing, man. What do you mean? Like you, you see people that are so uh, in tune and you're not sure you're like, what, you know, like, what no, am I? I, I, I get people messaging me all the time about our thing, about my, just my videos, our videos, and people are really um, find them helpful in whatever way. Well, that's uh, why we make the big bucks. That's right. That's why we make the big bucks. 
um but um it's one thing to just like get a message of like thank you very much with you know this is great and hazik me it's quite another to get something like this to where the person is basically on her, kind of on her own journey and this is essentially helping her to metamorphosize into into you know into what neshama is her neshama is already drawn to something clearly right well you know <clears throat> you know what the point of israel actually is i don't mean like the nation i mean like the land of israel yeah you do let's hear it <laughs> you're, asking, you're asking me what the point of israel is yeah, like um, this. listen, I mean, if, if, I, if I'm to parrot Rav Cook, it's to emanate uh, the light of Hashem onto the entire world. Um, that is correct. But there's also, um, if I'm going to, I'm going to channel Rabbi David Katz now. Okay. So, um, there is a, when we read the Hebrew scripture and we read the oral Torah, uh, there is this, uh, kind of unusual character that a lot of people don't really talk about mm -hmm. as much as we should. It's called the Ger Toshav. Yeah. Okay. So who is this Ger Toshav? Israel was made for him, for her. Okay. That means that Israel is supposed to be like, I, I created this metaphor. You know, like when you go to like a, medieval times or you go to uh, uh, Williamsburg, Virginia, you know, where they have like a yeah, yeah. colonial, they have like this colonial. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a, what do they call it? No, uh, uh, Renaissance Fair. Renaissance Fair is something else, but this is a oh, colonial, yeah. this is like a living. Ah, museum, okay, okay. Right? From, 17, from like 1700s. It's like what is a town, what is a colonial town like in the 1700s? Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's what Israel kind of that, that's that was one of its main purposes is that mm -hmm. uh when people come to israel they're like coming to colonial williamsburg uh, i was going to say colonial williamsburg uh and they see what it's not that it's like older i'm not talking about that i'm not i'm not focusing on the period aspect of it you know i'm not talking about like oh look what it's like <laughs> You know, look what it was like in the past. The point is, is that you go there to see what people lived like, right? But to Israel, you're going to go, you're supposed to go see what God wants people to live like. It's a, it, it's a, it's a theme park in, in that respect where people can come to visit and, and kind of see, okay, that's what God wants. Anybody who's interested. Right. Well, the, the, the certain parts where people are, are living like that, meaning, uh, you know, actually what you say, theme park, Rabbi Yom Tov Glazer once said that, uh, you, you know, he was talking to guys who were in, in his seminar, possible youth seminar in yeshiva. And he goes, so far, you guys are in the spiritual amusement park called Jerusalem. <laughs> that, that, he meant it a little bit different than, than the way I meant it. Yeah, like, yeah. No, he meant it. He meant it like, you know, Americans. Yeah. Anglos and, and, you know. Yeah, uh, European Jews, South Americans, they they come, yeah. they come to Israel. They hang out for a while. They have a great time. Yeah. They yeah. they get a little dose of spirituality. They yeah. you know they go on a couple of trips. So yeah. it has this kind of amusement park, yeah, like you know field trip type of feeling. Yep. To it, like a or even trip. if they stay in yeshiva for a long time, still they're going to shiurim. They go here. They go there. Shabbos meals. Yeah, they're on a program. You know, they're yeah. there's a there's a tour guide. You know that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. So it's not the regular human experience. Of, yeah. of living in Israel, so, uh, so that that's that's basically what he meant, I I'm, I, I think I think. Oh no, no, yeah, more or less. But this is this is different. This is actually, you come to see not the amusement park experience, but what the authentic experience is of living in a country that, and and with a people that is attempting to do God's will. Okay. Depending now, on where you go, not not like Tel Aviv or anything like that. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not talking about yeah. Israel now. I'm talking about Israel in the ancient past and Israel as to what it's supposed to actually be. Yeah. Okay. It's supposed to be a, a place where people from around the world uh, who want to come and learn about God, they come, they visit the temple, and, and those who want to stay can stay. And we have, once they, once they get like naturalized, 
and they have a status of wait, forget naturalized. I'm not sure if I use that term correctly. Once yeah, they get uh, like a like a let's say like a resident visa, something like that, yeah. right? Yeah. This, I'm talking about the ancient past, right? So they have a status of ger tosha, which means that they renounce idolatry. Okay, and there's a couple of other things, and uh, and they have to follow uh, at least the the seven laws of Noah yeah. and all of their sub laws, because seven laws are seven general laws. And each law itself has like many, many, many laws like associated with, it. you know what I mean? Like think about, we have, we have 613 laws, which are uh, derived from 10 commandments, mm -hmm. right? So, so the seven commandments of Noah, right? Are similar in that respect. So uh, it's not that simple. It, it does take knowledge. So you can live in Israel as a ger toshav, as a, as a, I guess, the translation would be a resident alien. Yeah. Okay. Something like that. Uh, no, it's it's actually. I'll tell you exactly. Here is a resident. A... Yeah, but I'll tell you the exact. Um, uh, it means uh, yeah, resident alien, a non-Jew living in the land of Israel who accepts to follow the seven laws of laws of Noah. Yeah. Okay. Now he doesn't have to. He or she does does not have to convert. They don't have to become Jewish. They could just be a human being as they are, live in Israel. They they can do. They can choose to follow yeah. all the commandments that Jews do. They can put on tefillin. They can wear tzitzis. They can do Ooh. everything except here's the here's the here's the catch. Except keep Shabbat. They cannot keep Shabbat the way a Jew keeps Shabbat. Yeah, they have to turn the light on like once. Something. They have to do something to to create a defect in because yeah. if because the Shabbat Shabbat is a covenant. By yeah. Even though it's a commandment, it is a covenant specifically only with the Jewish people. If you feel that strongly that about keeping Shabbat, that you, you're losing your mind, that you have yeah. to make, you have to turn the light on, or, you know, you got to do this one little defect, then you, you're, you're, you're a Jew and you have to, you have to convert. You have yeah. to become a proper, you know, like no more, no more pussyfooting around. You know what yeah. I mean? Like if, if you're in that mindset where you're driven mad by the fact that you can't keep Shabbos perfectly that means you have to become a jewish person yeah. listen okay. by the way the, the person that i read you know the, the the message that i read this is a person who's drawn to you know torah and davening and, and all these kind of things this is not that's just what, to that, shout that, that's why i'm bringing this up yeah, yeah. Oh, so greg right so basically <laughs> yeah all right so basically yeah i mean um that's what Israel is for is because God, Israel is like the Abraham of countries. Yeah. You understand? Yeah. Abraham had a tent with four openings towards each direction, each of the cardinal directions. Okay. Because he wanted to invite way wayfarers to come through and he wanted to be uh, courteous to them. He wanted to be a good host, feed them, you know, give them some water refreshments uh give them a break some you know some some uh, some shelter from the harsh conditions of the of the wilderness and he fed them all sorts of delicacies okay now the whole point of this was well there wasn't only one point but a big point of it was to teach people about god so israel is abraham's tent yeah it's a big one it's supposed to be Okay, so it's God land. Yeah, it's really it's it's God's country. You know, like like you know whenever you drive, yeah, whenever you're driving through America and you you see like beautiful wilderness, yeah. like it's real yeah. God's country. Well, yeah, it's God. Is God's country? And then you see a guy whipping out his uh, AR-15. Yeah, that's um, you know, that's 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 a sign of gullus. Yeah, I know. Okay, so so basically, um. Hang on just one second. Mm -hmm. one second. Uh, can I can I can I join you back in about uh, five minutes? I have to deal with a patient. Is that is that okay? Can you entertain the folks at home for sure. about five minutes? Guys, you know you're a very handsome guy. You have a you have a good radio voice. Yeah, you, know, you, you could oh, sing face for, face for radio, right? 
<laughs> I have a face radio. You got the face. That's why. That's why I'm trying not to scare the folks at home with, uh, you know, with a much better looking version. One of these days, you should. You should. You know, I think on the 40th podcast or the 39th, depending on the theme, you People should just unsubscribe, Greg. Right? You know, you should reveal yourself. You know how like uh, Hashem <laughs> took off his mask. Who was it? Hashem took off his mask. Who was wearing the mask? Hashem. What? Not Hashem. Uh, M- Moshe Rabbeinu. No. Moshe Rabbeinu wore a mask. Yeah. Because his face was lit up like a. Yeah. So, so on the fortieth episode, you have to show us. Your, it would be the one where you. Show us. I don't understand, Greg. Do you want people to watch I'm this? Taking, I'm taking. You know, it'll be it'll be dramatic at first, but you know, I think people will will uh, acclimate acclimate. They they will gasp. It's like a Satmar wedding. They'll learn to love you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. You never met the guy, but you know you meet him at the wedding, and you you know you learn to love him. You know, actually, I think we could keep talking like this if you don't mind. If I'm slightly distracted while I'm sending medication for someone. Um, listen, can I tell you something? That you can do that on air because you know I'll tell you. Uh, people have a sophic. Speaking of Amalek, they have a sophic that. You know, you do anything, that your brother does anything, that you, you people have treated anybody. So we can see in real time how you, you in action here. Yeah. You know, and you could tell us without going into too much detail what you actually just, so to speak, what was the case and what you have to send this person and all these kind of things. If, if it, you know, things that are not too private necessarily. Yeah, I, I, I'll say this. Like there are uh, captains of industry, people who have, started entire industries, high-level mm-hmm. politicians from multiple countries that I speak to daily who are who are who want the who want it, who want to take the protocol because they because they know what works. Yeah. There's also tons of doctors. Yeah. Doctors yep. who are contacting me. Well well when YouTube takes down our videos or my videos, it says you're not allowed to talk about anything of, of that of that protocol. It literally outlines that and it lists the, the names of the drugs that you can't talk about as as a treatment. <laughs> See, when we get into Russian, that's how you know. You know what I'm saying? Unbelievable. Seriously though. Yeah, the the NFL, these doctors are the top doctors in the NFL, National Football League. They are telling their players to take IVM as a as a as a preventative and also just as a treatment. I mean they're they're telling them, the doctors are telling them. You know, the specialists that they hire. The well, those doctor, guys are important, so of course they need, you know, they need the right. Yeah. Doctor. These guys are top tip top shaped, you know, 25, 27, 28, 30 year old guys who are like beasts. And like, they're taking this stuff. So, I mean, I don't know. Something's got to give here, you know? Yeah. But anyway, so go tend to your thing. I'm actually doing it. I'm kind oh, of like, yeah. trying to do it now. As we speak. Guys, those of you guys just joining us, uh, I'm talking to Ephraim here, and he's, he's filling a prescription for a patient, or he's filling, I guess, information. And there's been a lot of people who have sofek about actually what it is that he does, or if he does anything at all, or if his brother does anything at all, if he's actually treated patients. To to, to be to be more honest, I I I, ver- I very often I'm filling prescriptions because I do it by e-script mm-hmm. uh, during the during our conversations. Yeah. Uh, it's just that what I'm doing now is an entire family. Yeah. Oh, wow. so yeah, it takes a little. Uh, and then you know, trying to find a pharmacy that'll dispense Shobanis <laughs> Dochle. Seriously, the pharmacies, the people, the pharmacists who aren't dispensing this, Yemach Shomo Yeah, they are, they are murderers. Yeah. So, uh, so that's uh, you know, this this lady that got into the hospital, the one we said you're foolishly at the beginning of the program. Yeah. 45 years old, perfectly healthy. I think she took the, you know what, a few months ago. You know, uh, I called. I, so, so what happens is her daughter is in a different state. So she's like, listen, can they reach out to me if I can visit her? And I call this hospital. This is here in Jersey. And the hospital has a policy. Nobody can, nobody can even visit. 
the only the only uh, the only way that they would be able to visit this person if they, is if the person had some you know like some sort of special needs uh, situation you know developmental whatever it is or uh, end of life situation you know like the it, um, what is it called on breathing uh, not intubated but like you know what i mean like uh, what is it called no hooked up to tubes to machines um yeah. And you can't even visit. You can't even do bikur. This is the thing. They took away the mitzvah of bikur holim. You cannot even do that. Visiting the sick. It's a mitzvah. They took it away. It's not just a mitzvah by the Jews. It's a mitzvah. It's, it's a thing. That, you know? There's like non-Jewish organizations that do that. For people. It's not like... And this, you know, this woman just... I left the my number with the, you know, sec whatever, secretary over there, and there this woman who's in the hospital just texted me, oh, thank you so much, you know, if there's, you know, I'll let you know what's going on and this and that and the other. But um, I don't know what's going on with her. I don't know, she just had tests. I, you, there's no way to know. There's no way to advocate for a person. The person's there by themselves. It's, 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 it's like a, you know, you're setting things up for hospital. I'm like, what if a person's in a worse situation than this? Like, what are we doing here? <laughs> and uh, you know, you know, the beginning of the th this whole situation. What was it? Mar in, in 2020, people were just alone. Family members couldn't see them. They couldn't go to their funerals. Like, it's just, dude, it's it's, it's evil. It's evil incarnate. It's just there's nothing else to say. The whole process was evil. It has to be, it's, it's something, it must be that it's been, been something that's being done by Satanists, actual people who are doing some kind of satanic, mass satanic ritual, you know? I mean, I don't know, like... The, it, it smells like it. Yeah, but, okay, so let's... I've actually heard a couple of uh, Rabbanim talk about this uh, sat Satanism thing, you know, like what they think about it. Mm -hmm. So basically, the uh, they're based, you know, people who call themselves Satanists are are they're just silly fools. I mean, uh, you know, they're yeah. not in you, contact. You know, with I mean. you know what I mean? Right. No, no I'm just saying. Yeah. So I'm worried more about the people who aren't, you know, doing, you know, the kind of silly stuff. I'm talking about the people who actually understand. I know. That's what I'm real, talking about. Real Avodah Zara. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. You know, and they're, you know, they don't, they don't do secret rituals anymore. They pass laws Correct. worldwide Correct. to, you know, mass sacrifice, yeah. mass Correct. child sacrifice, you know, they, wars, right? What do you think yeah. wars are? They're yeah. financed by both sides. Okay. Yeah. Those are sacrifices to yeah. Baal. So to get energy from the to side. Get, yeah. whatever, their, whatever their reasons are, those are sacrifices to Baal, mass blood sacrifices. That are it, it, it's all coordinated by you know the 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 highest you know echelons of power you know mm -hmm. like the, the 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 elite right the royals and mm -hmm. and the robber barons uh, you know from uh, from the early 1900s. Do you know what? By the way, what Shmurla posted yesterday on his Twitter, I found this to be very very interesting. I do not. Congratulations to uh, Chief Development Officer of Schmeiser, Rod McKen Rick McKenzie, for being named a companion in the Order of St. Michael and St. George, a great honor from the royal family. The same honor given to 007 himself. What a wonderful recognition of your work to help bring hope to the world during this pandemic. Uh, okay. Fashtes? Yes, sir. Explain that. Explain that. Explain it a little bit more to me because I'm a little bit distracted. The, the C, CDO, I don't know what he does, Chief Development Officer, Officer of Schmeiser was given an award by the royal family. And, it, and the, the, award is, the award is called... Uh, it's called a companion in the order of St. Michael and St. George, CMG. 
what is this award? Let's see what this award is. Let's look it up. Uh, let's see. Order of St. Michael and St. George. So some people get knight. And he was being named, he got named companion. What is this? CMG. It's like, it's a designation, it's the lowest designation. So you got, you know, you have knight grand cross, which is the highest, and dame grand cross, which is, I guess, what, female. Uh, knight commander, dame commander, and then companion, CMG. Here, what is companion? The order originally included 15 knights grand cross, 20 knights commanders, and 25 companions. Has limits on membership 125, 375, and 1750, respectively. Members of the royal family who are appointed to, to the order do not count towards the limit. Okay. Uh, here. Knights, commanders, and male com companions wear the badge from a ribbon. Uh, the badge is only an insignia used by members of the order. It's suspended on blue crimson ribbon, knights and dames, da da da. This is describing this thing. Ah. The badge is a seven-armed white enameled Maltese asterisk. The obverse shows St. Michael trampling on Satan, while the reverse shows St. George on horseback killing a dragon, both within a dark and blue ring bearing the motto of the order. Prior to 2011, the devil, the devil was portrayed with black skin while St. Michael was shown as being white. This was changed that year to show both with the same skin color. Although St. Michael's Wings were changed from being multicolored to being pure white. The alleged racism of this imagery has resulted in the government of Jamaica suspending the use of the badge entirely. In June 2020, calls were made for a complete redesign of the insignia, including from Sir Michael Palin of Monty Python fame, a knight commander of the order. Do you find, do you, my friend, find any of this interesting for yourself? Tell me, I mean, it is very interesting, but tell me, uh, tell me what you find interesting. So I know what you're what I find about. interesting. I mean, like you, we understand that this is, a, this is an elite organ, you know, this royal family, they're still around. I, nobody knows why. Oh, you, you mean the connect just, I thought you were asking about the symbolism specifically. You There's also the, the symbolism connect. too. Also the symbolism. Why, why are they showing? So, you know, it's interesting that the guy is trampling Satan. But then not, they used to be different colors. He used to be white. Satan was black, and now he became black, and Satan became black, and is still black. So now what? They've gone to Satan. Wait, I don't understand. I thought they both became white. Uh, let's read it again. One sec. One sec. One sec. Companion. One sec. If I'm not I, unless I'm mistaken. You're probably not mistaken. Just kidding, me. Yeah, the devil was portrayed prior to 2011. Oh, okay, he be became white. They made the devil. So they made the devil white. They elevated. They elevated him. Basically, you know what it is. I th I think I can interpret that symbolism. How do you? How do you like this? Listen to this. Okay. okay. So forget about the the fact that it's pretty messed up that they made the devil black, you know, and the good guy white. Okay, that's that's, that's yeah. kind of messed up. Yeah. But let's step out of that mindset for a moment. Yeah. Okay? Forget about the black color being connected to racism against yeah. black people. Yeah. By the way, black people aren't black. Yeah, I know. Exactly. Okay? I don't know. Why do I mean, brown it seems more of a, yeah. an accurate color. I don't know why you call them black. I don't know why white people, white people aren't white either. Yeah. Why can't we pick a more accurate Anyway, okay. so yeah. we're, we're beige, right? Yeah. Kind of a shade. Uh, beige is, is a yeah. shade of brown. Yeah. Anyway, the point is, so you had, you had these two opposite archetypal figures. Mm -hmm. And they're, and, and the point is that they're, they are distinguished. Forget about, you know, Forget about what it is that distinguishes them in appearance. Let's say one is one is uh, green, the other one's red. Okay, let's let, let's say the the red one the red color means uh, you know the bad and the green is the good. Okay, let's just designate that. Okay. Yeah. Um, so before the green was 
killing the evil, which is the red. Okay, because mm -hmm. I, I think I've seen that imagery. It's like a there's like a lance piercing, like the dragon, or or or, or piercing like the the devil, right? He's being trampled or something like that. So, so you have this uh, green good guy, red bad guy. Okay, so now what you did is you took the the red guy and made him green, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the good guy who was piercing the bad guy, what is that really saying? It's saying that that is the old incarnation of me, right? That's the devil piercing his old self, saying like that, you see that image of me before? That's dead now. Now, now I am the good guy. Now I look like the good guy. Yeah. Right? They've converted mm -hmm. the bad guy to the good guy and they killed the old image of the bad yeah. guy. Yeah. That's what that symbol means. That's what it feels to me that it means. That, that, that's what it makes sense. It, it's, shedding the, it's shedding the old costume mm -hmm. and moving on to a, to a costume that looks more like you, yeah. more like me. Yeah. Right? He wants to blend in. He wants to, the devil now. Instead of looking like a crazy whatever the hell he looks like, yeah. he wants to look just like us, and because he wants to be normalized, that represents the devil being normalized. The greatest trick, what is it? Uh, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled, convincing the world, convincing the world he didn't exist. Yeah, Kaiser Sose. and like that, he's gone. Yeah. What a what a probably one of the greatest endings to any movie ever. Yeah, ever. I, I don't say, you know, I don't, I, I don't take liberties in saying these things. Dude, Kevin Spacey, people forget. Terrifying, terrifying bad guy. Yeah. Kaiser Soze. Kaiser Soze. <laughs> I love how he just... That you know, origin story, I, I don't want to hear that. Just... No, not the origin story. I mean, I'm talking about the whole thing of like Chas Palminteri when he realizes, you know, cop. Yeah. Yeah, everything that went on, and he's like looking at uh, red foot and this and that, and he drops the glass the cup. Obayashi, the yeah. cup. Obayashi. Barber Shark yeah. Quartet. Yeah. Tokyo, <laughs> Illinois. Yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing. Remember, remember what they did to Benicio del Toro when he was in a he was in a lineup, uh -huh. and I'm like, please say, you know, give me the effing tease, you effing yeah, another that right? He's supposed to say that. And yeah. everybody was saying that, and then he's like, he's like, right? And then yeah. the guy's like in English suspect please. lineup. Uh, what happened? Yeah. No, I want to play the scene, the cop's reaction to Benicio del Toro. Yeah. Um, so that I can. It's gonna be profanity. Makes sense that I'd be there. Uh, I mean, these guys were hardcore hijackers. You could hear, right? There I was. Yeah. At that point, I wasn't scared. I knew I hadn't done anything they could do me for. <laughs> Besides, it was fun. I got to make like I was notorious. <laughs> all right, you all know the drill. When your number is called, step forward and repeat the phrase you've been given. Understand? Number one, step forward. Kevin Pollock. <sighs> Hand me the keys, you fucking cocksucker. Okay. Don't play the until the fight. Jeez, you fucking ah! step forward. Cut. I need the keys, you cock sucker. In English, hey. please. Excuse me. Yeah. In English. I need the fucking keys, you cock sucker. What the fuck? Oh, no, huh? Number four, step forward. Anyway. My father met Gabriel Byrne at the Rainbow Room once. Did I ever tell you that? You did not tell me that. My parents went to the Rainbow Room with their friends. This was years ago. I, shortly after the, that movie came out, my parents went to for like a birthday or something like that. Late 90s, I guess you could say. And uh, Gabriel Byrne was there, I think with his wife. Oh, yeah? Her. Oh, yeah? Well, huh. Oh yeah. Well, uh, a friend's girlfriend once met Richard Bay. Huh. In the 90s. So how do you like that, huh? Take that. By the way, speaking of smokestacks, 
His wife? I saw Dan Aykroyd from a distance one time at this one lounge. Uh-huh. It was oh, I, I told you I had dinner with Roseanne Barr, right? You're kidding. No, I'm not. That's so cool. She followed this uh, blog when I was posting, at, uh, you know, kind of more extensively on uh, Twitter. And she started following one of my posts because she, po- you know, follows all this Israel stuff. And then, um, uh, yeah, started talking and I sent her wine. And then she just started talking about, she's into Kabbalah and Rav Kook and all this kind of stuff. And uh, that's amazing. And she's talking and she's like, yeah, I'm coming to New York and my, I'm going to be my daughter. Because I told them Russian speaker. And apparently there's a, she has one of her daughters who she gave up for adoption when she was younger. Like she was one of the, you know, the first kid she had when she was very young, when Roseanne was very young. And then she reunited with her when she was like 18. The daughter's now in her, you know, like 40s. She actually married a Russian speaking guy or a Russian guy, non-Jew. Uh, but the da- daughter is technically Jewish, you know, obviously. Yeah. So we had dinner. We went to a reserve cut. And, what is it uh, called reserve cut? Yeah, it's like this, uh, you know, it's funny, actually. It's on, it's on Broad Street in, uh, in the downtown near Wall Street. And it's the same building where I used to work in trading. And, they conv- and that building became, it went from being an office building to like a satai, you know, the spa. And then uh, like hotel, and then and then uh, upstairs is the restaurant, a kosher uh, steakhouse. So we we went there. It was funny. I got there, and there and the, and the maitre d of the place. He's like, "Oh, I'm like, yeah, I'm here with uh, whatever reservation the, uh, under uh, my name." But then like I notified that you know Roseanne Barr is coming. He's like, "Oh," and then he's like, "Dude, these guys they do they start doing research. They call the hotel. They find out what hotel. You know, they have all these connections. This guy is like, oh, we're told Miss Barr." has a, you know, um, uh, sight, whatever. She has like um, sight impaired or something like that. She has a, walks with a cane. Dude, she has cataracts and astigmatism, which is very oh, rare. Usually people have so one or the other. So Both? Well, I had cataracts, uh-huh. which I just recently had. Yeah. Okay. And, and I do have astigmatism. She has cataracts and astigmatism. She smokes like weed for that. <laughs> And uh, it's funny. Yeah, she's like, we're told she this, she that. I'm like, I, I didn't know any of this. I didn't even tell these guys anything. I just said that we, you know, we have a reservation for whatever and this and that and the other. You know? And they, and they found out and uh, it was cool. It was good. Her, she came with her daughter. She was telling me how she like wants to get a house in the Shamron and wants to go to Tzfat to learn. That's unbelievable. And wants to make Aliyah. We were talking about, you know, I was telling her about the Soviet Union stuff. And she was like, yeah, I was helping soviet refuseniks when she was in utah in the north american jewish federations this is back when federations were normal you know Dude, hashem hashem wants her she was drummed out of hollywood for this dude, reason alone. she knows she knows that she knows that dude she knows that like she knows that <laughs> you know thank god you know, she's, a lucky, very, one of the luck, she's one of the few lucky ones Baruch hashem, man. you know because whatever she you knows she she used to go to back in the day to kabbalah center when madonna was there and then she realized that this whole thing is like a little bit strange and uh, but she still learns, you know, she, she was writing to me about this and that, you know, that uh, sphere and this sphere and this and that and the other. And uh, what's it called? And um, yeah, and talking about Rough Cook. Actually, you know what? Let me play for you here. There's an interview. She went to Israel recently. And she spoke about here. I think I even posted this, but then my channel got erased. My main channel here. Uh, one second. She had a thing in Israel. Yeah, that thing got taken down. Son of a gun. However, it might be up somewhere if we can find it. See, these YouTube guys, they don't want you to find anything that you want to find. They just want you to find what they want to tell you that you should watch. They are a bunch of losers. Uh, here you go. Okay. Uh, tells her Jewish. I want to get to the part where she talks about like um, cook. Oh, this is like a whole twenty-six minutes. Like, oh, that is where I grew up. Okay. I grew up. Okay. The question I asked her in the morning. Boom. Say the things that I'm going to say. This was in 2019. Was taught, what? When was this? 2000 February 2019. She was in Israel. Okay. 
the kids, so she spoke in the Menachem Begin Center, she spoke about Rav Kook and all these ideas. And it was very, very nice. That is amazing. Huh. It was everybody, very nice. everybody who was drummed out of Hollywood is lucky. I know. Hollywood is the dustpan yeah. of the Jewish people. Dustbin. <laughs> you know what? Okay, you know, like, I'm trying to think of, of, of this thing where it's like a refining kind of thing. It's like, I guess it's like a sifter, but like the lowest stuff collects in this little deposit, you know, like this little divot. I don't know how to explain. It's the dustbin, okay? It's like, a, what's funny is that when people worldwide, when they want to know about Jews, right, they hear about Hollywood and that's what they think. Mm -hmm. That's what they unfortunately think about Jews, but we, those are the rejects. <laughs> from the, yeah. I wish the world would know that. Yeah. That's where all the bitter rejects, most of whom rejected themselves in a sense, not, not rejected themselves, but they excluded themselves. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask you a question? What is it about what I'm noticing? I'm noticing a pattern here. Uh, I mean, I guess we already see the pattern, saw the pattern before COVID that, uh, how should I put this? Attractive women tend to be conservative, politically speaking. Not always the case, but it's it's a predominantly. I mean, like in the real world, not in. Not in yes, and left. so I'm looking. I'm looking on Twitter. The first thing I see is this girl. Can some? She has a blue check mark. She's like, you can tell she's conservative. Uh, weirdly attracted to men who don't wear masks in shops, even if they're not actually my type. Has anyone else experienced something like this? <laughs> I think that's kind of more of a of a social commentary than. Yeah, you know, but uh, I'm noticing like a lot of the women that I've been meeting who are, or at least the ones I'm, I'm coming across are, are you know, against this whole stuff. Pretty, uh, in the words of Larry David, pretty, pretty, pretty good. Pretty, 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 pretty good. Yeah. There, there's like a pattern here of people who like freedom. And know how to think, you know. I think that um, <clears throat> mindset does have an impact on physicality, uh, generationally. Yeah. Okay. So definitely, the victim mindset does affect physicality in an, in a negative way. Uh, the person who feels like they're being victimized. Uh, I don't know. It, there's probably, it's a layered thing. There's probably a spiritual element as always, uh, which is the main mm -hmm. element. But then you have kind of like the self-fulfilling prophecy element where it's like, I'm a victim, so I shouldn't really try. I'm not, I, I, I don't have a chance. Yeah. So I'm not going to go and take care of myself. I'm not going to go and eat healthy. I'm not going to go and, you know, uh, learn how to fight. I'm not going to go and get into shape. Like yeah. those are fight training, getting into shape, eating healthy. These are connected to the, to a, a mindset that a victim doesn't connect to. Yeah. You have to be free. So you have to kind of be free of the victim mindset in order to be successful at those things yeah i mean obviously we're like sitting around a little bit generalizing right now not to say that people with different political slants don't go to the gym yeah, but, but, it, but, yeah, but i have noticed a pattern yeah. I, I, yeah. I'm, I'm talking about myself yeah. by the way yeah i mean i've had periods where you know, you feel sorry for yourself. You feel like you're not going to, you know, like you're not yeah, going to sure. succeed. So, so then your behavior begins to mm -hmm. create yeah. that. Yeah. It reinforces it. Yeah. We've all been there, sir. We've all been there. So number 37, 
Tell me, sir. We spoke about this yesterday. I am woefully unprepared, but if you just if you just give me one moment, I will oh, good. find my notes. Sing for the folks at home. <laughs> so for those of you guys just joining us, we've been talking about everything under the sun. Uh, we've been getting into the whole thing about Ger Toshav, what Israel is for. We spoke about Rosa and Barr. We spoke about, uh, what else, the usual suspects. We spoke about, uh, um, I don't even remember, but my friend Ephraim is going to now tell us about, this is episode 37, he's going to tell us about uh, the number 37, which you spoke about yesterday. I think you put it into, uh, if you can hear me, the, the Trogmans, and you found something interesting about Hevel. Yeah. Talk about Hevel. Abel, as you guys know him, the guy who was killed by his brother Cain, if not mistaken. First, first murder victim. Yes. Talk about so that, being a victim. So that's 37. Gematria 37. Wow, very interesting. I, I remember that, there, that he had an aspect of his personality that was. <laughs> Kind of like that. That was uh, he had the mindset of a victim. Really, I didn't know that. Yeah, I heard. I actually heard. Can you get into that more? With the Miller, there are these clips that are posted to YouTube sometimes from old. About Rabbi who? Victor Miller. Oh, a Vig a Victor. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So. Uh, okay. Hold on. Let's see. This is on YouTube. Um, somebody was posting. There you go. A victim ruler, the righteous walk in them. No, he has like he has like millions of lectures. Wow. He has a bunch of them. Yeah. But this one obviously was on Parshat Bereshit. Mm -hmm. um, oh, okay. and, and he was he was actually talking about one second. He was talking about uh, what happened between Cain and Hevel, mm -hmm. Cain and Abel. Yeah. Uh, you know, I didn't find, so far, I didn't find uh, about 37 yet, but I did find Rabbi Ginsburg's mm. lecture. Please tell us about that. On Parshat Yitro. So keep that in mind. That's where mm -hmm. the Torah is there. So there, there's a, the Fibonacci sequence is encoded mm. in there. Uh, hang on, hang on. One second. Avigdo Miller had a whole thing about an Ashkenazi should marry an Ashkenazi. Oh my goodness! Seriously? <laughs> no, no, he was, no, he was gangster. Mm. He he wasn't like you know he's really really old school guy and he he moved absolutely babarabano as they say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what anybody thought on, on the on the drum meaning he didn't care. <laughs> couldn't he couldn't I I, I wanted to, I didn't want to say what I really wanted to say. Yeah, yeah. A little bit crude, you know, as what we right. usually say. Yes, because, you know, but uh, yeah, we'll, say, was, that, we'll say that about Bill Schmitz, you know, yeah, I'll say not it. about the okay. So, let me. I found okay, I found what I thought I was looking for, okay, and I see the number 37, mm -hmm. okay? I see it, and uh, I what I can do is I can go through the notes if you, if you okay. Hey, now, before you get into it, can you give me 30 seconds? I want to get some a drink. I'm, I'm parched. No, I think I think the folks at home have, have been patient enough. Shit enough. <laughs> I used up all their patience, Greg. You can't have anything to drink. Greg went anyway.
All right, sir, let's get into this. <clears throat> Intermission over. Back mm -hmm. to your speech, folks. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so, you now, Greg, you have a tendency to fall asleep, but I need yeah. you to be awake fall here. Asleep. I'm awake. I'm awake. Okay. Get your coffee, get your Red Bull, get your oh. monster. It gives get you the, wings. Get the coca. Get, get the coca. 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 Okay. You got some coca? You got some yayo? Okay. I'm a political prisoner from Cuba. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I said sen I said Senate. I said sanitation, not sanitarium. No, I said sanitarium, not sanitation. <laughs> okay. That was hilarious, by the way. Like I, mm -hmm. I don't know why people don't quote that all the time. Anyway. When the movie came out, it was it received a very, very bad reception when it came out in theaters. And then it became a cult classic, which is interesting. It's funny, like my dad, he was working in a limousine company right, mm -hmm. for, for a number of years. And, you know, it was a lot of Russian guys, not just, but, you know, it was, I would say at least half of them were Russian guys. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the guys looked like, what was the name of the actor who played Tony Montana's friend, you know, the, who he ends up killing? You know, the guy, the guy, his best friend from Cuba, you know, like the one who. Oh, uh, uh, so, 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 Tony Montana's best friend? Yeah. You mean, uh, uh, oh, the, uh, hold on. The tall guy, you know? The one yeah, who, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, his name, his name, hold on. He, try to, he was always trying to pick up girls and getting smacked. I know, I know. He's like, he, yeah, he's like a sleazebag. Uh, so <laughs> his name was, uh, he played a, a Stephen Bauer, Manny Ray. Stephen Bauer. He played Manny. There was a guy who worked with my dad mm -hmm. who looked exactly like him. Exactly. It was like, it was on the Jewish guy. He looked yeah. exactly like, and they called him Lodge. That's funny. Raj? It, like Roger? Like, you know, I mean, it sounds like Ski Lodge, right? Oh, Lodge, Lodge. Yeah. But mm -hmm. really, there it was just a bunch of Russian guys struggling to say the word large. <laughs> he was... <laughs> He was, you know, he was a tall guy, right? Mm -hmm. so they called him, hey, Lodge, come here, Lodge. <laughs> That's actually hilarious. Yeah. No, that guy, he's, a, he's, he's actually a nice guy. Oh, that's yeah. funny. And they, every, you know, this is a, just on a side note. It's mm -hmm. hilarious. There's a, there's a guy, which this whole, the whole limousine company, right? And many others. There's a mechanic that everybody, oh, there's like a couple of mechanics that they frequented, right? Because mm -hmm. they needed a lot of car repair. Mm -hmm. And, uh, one of them, one of them, they called Chorne Grisha. Oh my God! What the hell? No, because, <laughs> because no, but listen, listen, because it's a, it's, it's a, it's a black guy named Greg <laughs> who learned how to speak Russian after <laughs> years of interacting with these guys. He became <laughs> Russian. So, so he married a Russian lady. <laughs> so he he was the first to call out these guys. I don't know. What the, I don't. I don't know. But he was hilarious. Oh, like, funny. Eyes. I grew up speaking to a black guy who spoke Russian, and I called him Grisha. I I I I, I just think that I don't know what what I'm accomplishing by telling that story. I just think it's a remarkable. Okay. You're accurate. coffee by making me cry coffee, dude. There was a, all these black singers in Russian restaurants. You know, there there's a woman. Oh, that from was Moscow. obviously bon M, of course. Like, you know. Not just Boniem. There's like this woman from Moscow that used to sing. She was like half black, half Russian. Used to sing in Russian restaurants. There was the guy who sang your chocolate and the Zayats. I'm a chocolate bunny. <laughs> I never, I never heard that one. It's absolute <laughs> hilarity, man. It's hilarity. It's very funny. No, I, no, I mean, yeah. There's a lot of great entertainers, uh, black entertainers that, that they, they worked a lot at Russian restaurants. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, okay. We got to talk about, we got to talk about Bonnie M. By the way. Yes, Russian, queen, Russian, Rasputin, Russian queen. That's right. The eeriness. Right, right, Rasputin. Listen to this. Listen to this. The lead singer, listen to this, listen to this. The lead singer right? Uh -huh. He's a. Now this band is a bunch of Jamaicans. They're Ger G German. No, no, no. Oh, no. Created by German producer Frank Ferry. No, no, no. They went. They're from Jamaica. Yeah. And they went to live in Germany. Yeah. And that's where, uh, yeah. and that's where they made it big. Yeah. And then. They, they kind of became international, 
You know, the guys they're Jamaican, them. British. Some of them are British, Ghanaian. Yeah, and and, and who, who were singing about Rasputin? So they're yeah. Jamaicans <laughs> from Germany yeah. who were obsessed with the Russians. Okay, <laughs> yeah. especially with one Russian in particular, Rasputin. Yeah. Yeah. Listen to this: the guy <laughs> who sang Rasputin, he died on the same day that Rasputin died. Bobby Farrell. That was, I think that, yeah, that, that's the lead singer, right? December 30th, 2010, Roberto Alfonso Farrell. And let's see Rasputin. Uh, December, it says December 30th, but then it says OS, oh, old new dates. Oh, okay, dating system, December 17th. So yeah, December 30th, essentially, 1916. This guy died December 30th. Wow, that's interesting. And, 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 and so Rasputin was a big part of his life. Like and he died in St. Petersburg, this guy, this Bobby yes, Farrell. Yes, 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 that's right. I forgot that. That's Very where Rasputin, isn't that where Rasputin died? Uh, I think it, I'm hoping it was in Moscow. Yeah, he died in Peter. What the hell? Dude. What the dude, heck? That is Gilgul right there. Oh, my God. If, I, if I've ever, if I... Bobby Farrell was the Gilgul of Rasputin? <laughs> to such an extent, like, you know, he, you could tell he kind of even like he worshipped Rasputin, you know, like when, when you, like I saw some old clips of him, like from the 70s, like in concerts and stuff like that. He yeah. had this crazy look in his eyes, you know. Yeah, I'm like, looking at them now. Yeah, Bobby Farrell dies in the same. This is so weird. There's like articles about this and he looks like he has like a beard and this whole get up. What the hell? This is so I'm, bad. I'm hoping that he, it wasn't like, you know, a, a suicide. Ritual. Yeah, a ritual. What's it called? Yeah. yeah. It's just so Whatever. odd. It's so odd. Here, let me read this article. Bobby Farrell dies on the same day and in the same town as Rasputin, the subject of one of the band's biggest hits. This is the article in uh, Daily Mail in 2010. Uh, Life sadly imitated art for Bonnie M's Bobby Farrell today as his death turned into an uncanny coincidence relating to one of his biggest hits. The front man died in St. Petersburg right yesterday on the same date and in the exact same, exact same town as mad Russian monk Rasputin, who was the subject of band's 1978 top three single. The eccentric frontman was found dead in his hotel room, age 61, just hours after a performance in the city where the band rose to stardom in the Soviet era, according to his agent. But while the cause of Farrell's death is still not clear, it couldn't be more diff different to that of Grigory Rasputin, who said the lyrics in Bonnie Bonnie M's song was the lover of the Russian queen. Rasputin was 47 when his body was recovered from Neva River. He had drowned after being poisoned, shot four times, badly beaten, and thrown in the river. He was the subject of Bonnie M's hit, which was top five hit across Europe. Today, Farrell's agent, Johnny Sane, 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 who was based in the Netherlands, said of Farrell, he did a show last night as part of Bobby Farrell's Bonnie M, and they found him this morning dead in his hotel room. He did not feel well last night and was having problems with his breathing, but he did the show anyway. Uh, the cause of death was not immediately clear, according to Sergei Kapitanov, a representative of St. Petersburg branch of Russia's investigative committee. Bonnie M, consisting of Farrell, Maisie Williams, Liz Mitchell, and Marsha Barrett, was one of the most successful bands of the late 70s, with Farrell becoming famed for his lip syncing as much as his dancing in the disco band. The band's hits included Daddy Cool, Ma Baker, and Rasputin. Indeed, their version of Mary Boy's Child, Oh My Lord, was a Christmas Daddy number one. Daddy Cool, yeah. Daddy, Daddy Cool. Is that in it? 1978, and is the 10th biggest, sell 10th biggest selling single of all time in Britain. The double A sided single Brown Girl in the Ring and Daddy Cool, also released in 78 was the biggest selling single of that year. Indeed, it remains the sixth biggest selling single of all time in, in Britain. Farrell was born on the island of Aruba, one of the lesser Antilles. He lived in Norway and the Netherlands before moving to Germany. He worked largely as a nightclub DJ before music producer Frank Farron signed him up for the new pop group he was putting together, which became Boney M. Farrell was the sole male singer in the group. Uh, however, Farron later revealed that Bobby made almost no vo vocal contributions to the group's records. Instead, Farron sang the male parts on the songs in the studio or well, the producer himself. Farrell did, however, perform the songs live. The band Bonnie M was put together by German singer-songwriter Frank Farian, who also produced most of the vocals from the group. Frank was also producer to the group Millie Vanilli. Remember the, the, when they had that whole scandal? Yeah. That was the same guy. I see a pattern. Amazing, yeah, right? <laughs> Amazing tracks, by the way, Millie Vanilli. Blame it on the rain. Cause controversy when you admitted that the guys... I love you. Who, yeah, who confronted the group did not actually sing, who fronted the group did not actually sing the songs. Uh, the original Bonnie M broke up more than 20 years ago. Farrell was a front man for a group called Bobby Farrell and Bonnie M. Whatever, so we go on to this whole thing. History. 
You know, can I say yeah. something? So this weird. Is, yeah. the one, the, this is like the one funny thing Janine Garofalo ever said, as far as I'm concerned, right? Yeah. Where, where she's talking about the Mentos commercials, mm-hmm. right? And you know how, like, do you recall the Mentos commercials? It's like they had these, like, kind of, like, really cheesy kind of... Yeah, like, Mentos, the fresh maker. No, but you have, like, these, like, really kind of silly yeah. scenarios, right? Yeah. Where yeah. everybody looks, like, young and fresh, and they're, like, super white. Everybody's, like, it, it, it doesn't seem... It, it look, it's almost like it could be in America, but there's something off about it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, and then Janine Garofalo was like, and every time I see a Mentos commercial, I was like, I, I don't know, are these... Germans? <laughs> like, what are you know, like, yeah, that's funny. That's exactly what I thought when yeah. I would see those girls. Like, are these Germans who are trying to create like an yeah. American scene or something like yeah. that? Yeah. You know? you know, like you have the stereotypical like you know young kid with a back sideways hat on a on a skateboard yeah. Yeah. holding yeah. a football. You know, like something is not. Somebody's trying to do yeah. something here, and it's not authentic. I know. I know. <laughs> it's like a bunch of Germans. That's exactly how I felt when I saw Millie Vanilla. <laughs> no, but no, 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 at least the songs were catchy. And good. Oh, before I knew anything about yeah, them, yeah, I, was sure. like, I was like, these are not American yeah. black people. Oh, of course not. Of course not. No, no, no but I, I was a kid. Yep. Yeah, Dude, yeah, I, I, I know. I could, you could tell. You can tell because you see. Listen, the, 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 the guys we saw in Brooklyn, <laughs> the guys we saw in Brooklyn were slightly different from these, from these Milli Milli Vanilli guys. Obviously. Even yeah. kids can tell that. <laughs> No, it's like, you know, it's like, I, I, like, it's interesting. Like, as I was growing up as a kid, I realized, like, I could tell an American, regardless mm-hmm. of what, like, you know, ethnicity they are. Mm-hmm. I could tell American Blacks right away. I could tell there's a difference between yeah. Black people from Europe. It's, I, I don't know what it is. It's like, you could just tell, right? <laughs> At all. Anyway. Yeah. And you can't By the way, say, man. By the way, you cannot say it's because they're light skinned. Because if you look at those. Uh, no, 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 no. One of them is a. No, no, no. no. What's his name? Fab Morvan. What are you talking about? You talk about. Um, oh, maybe not. No. What are those twins? You know, like those funny twins, like the black dudes. Uh, they were always on Steven Crowder and they have their own. Oh, oh. Uh, the, the, the. Uh, uh, I love these guys. Uh, I can't remember. I'm getting zapped. They are called the guys who are named the Hodge, Hodge twins. Hodge. The Hodge twins. Okay. Yeah. yeah. They could, they kind of got that Millie Vanilli kind of like, you know. Yeah. Like, Except they're American. But I knew, I, I know they're American straight off yeah. the bat. It's yeah. a look. <laughs> it, it's an expression on the face. There's yeah. a, I don't know what it is, but like there's kind of like this strange sort of blankness that yeah. Europeans have. It's like a, it's, it's, it's a strange unaware, it's like this uh, aloofness. Yeah. That's the only way I can really yeah. describe it. Except for Italians, hmm. Southern Italians. Yeah. Southern Italians, some Greeks, yeah. perhaps some French people, you know, they have like a little bit of a different look. It's not better. <laughs> huh. yeah. Anyway, so that uh, was all. That was I all read really something, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read you something in the way that I want to read it. Mm-hmm. Kazakhstan Armed Security Forces are in Almaty. They are also armored personnel carriers, armored vehicles and military trucks. Local police report that dozens of protesters had been crushed like Stalin. Have been uh, what? You know what's going on in Kazakhstan now, right? You sent me something. There's basically a, people are revolting against the government and the, the military is putting them down with live fire. Holy crap. Killing them. There's a new president. What's his name? Uh, Nusutan Nazabayev leave. A new one called Tokayev. He will crush everyone. <laughs> uh, even though it's not that funny. Yeah, this guy Tokayev. Uh, yeah. uh, oh my God, what the hell? He's got all these, he had all these positions before. Hey, you know what? You know what? Mm-hmm. So uh, with, that, with that being said, uh, Torah increases peace in the world. So let's... Okay. Let me, let's read some Torah. What do you think? All right, so 37. Tell me about 37. And Okay, so a little bit of patience. This is Rabbi Ginsburg's lecture. Mm-hmm. Lovely. Okay, Ra- okay, Rabbi Ginsburg, Shiur on Yosef. <coughs> okay. Yosef is one of the seven shepherd souls of Israel. Yosef is considered the tzaddik 
per, per excellence. We were talking about tzaddikim yesterday, so now we're gonna get a sense of what are, what is a tzaddik. That, you know, we should actually talk about that. Yeah. Okay. So he, is, so Yosef is considered the tzaddik per excellence of the Torah. Why? Because he would he withstood the trial of temptation. He was able to completely conquer his Yitzhahara. Because of that, he was given the eternal name Yosef Hatzadik. Yeah. Okay. The month of Tammuz, Tammuz is considered the month of Yosef. Okay. There are actually four opinions from the Gemara as to when Yosef was born. All four opinions are in Tammuz. Okay. So nobody's, everybody agrees Tammuz. Okay. Mm -hmm. The first opinion is that he was born on the first of Tammuz. Okay. So Tammuz always has two days of Rosh Chodesh. Okay. The first day is the 30th of Sivan, which is the last, which is the last month. And then the second day is mm -hmm. the first of Tammuz. So, so the second opinion is that he was born on the following day, which is the second of Tammuz. Okay. So the third opinion is that he was born on the seventh of Tammuz. And the fourth opinion is that he was born on the 27th of Thomas. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, uh, so we have a very beautiful cubic series of numbers mm -hmm. associated with this. Mm -hmm. So Joseph is the wisest of all of the brothers. The brothers, you know, the, the, the 12 tribes of Israel, his brothers. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in some sense, the wisest person in, in, in the whole of Torah. Of all the souls in the Torah, Joseph has a, a strong affinity to mathematics. You could tell that, uh, that Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Ginsburg greatly he likes Kimotra. admired. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, he himself is, is a mathematician and, mm -hmm. and uh, gets a lot of joy out of, out of uh, revealing the math in the Torah. Yeah. And Joseph, Joseph is the, you know, he's the, he's the great granddaddy of this. Yeah. So Joseph has a, a strong affinity to mathematics. He was, he was a mathematician. Yeah. Okay. He made sure to be born on four different days. Hmm. Okay. In Tama. Yeah. He had a, he had a good reason behind that. Mm -hmm. Now let's, that's a little bit of tongue in cheek, but, but not really. Okay, now let's discuss how one calculates a series of numbers based on finite, quote unquote, finite differences. How one would calculate what would be the following number or numbers uh, to infinity. Okay, so let's put the four days of Joseph's birth in a series, okay? Tamos the first, the mm -hmm. first of Tamos, okay? Then the second of Tamos. That's the second opinion. The third opinion is the, the seventh of Tammuz, and then you have the 27th of Tammuz. So again, that's the first of Tammuz, the second of Tammuz, the seventh of Tammuz, and the 27th of Tammuz. Okay. Mm -hmm. So taking quote unquote finite differences from one to two is one. Right? There's one separating one to two. Okay. Yes. Now from two to seven is five. Okay. From, mm -hmm. seven, from seven to 27 is 20, okay? So beneath the original series of numbers, we, we, we now have the number set one, five, and 20. Do, should I review how we got that? Yeah. I should, okay. Okay, so the original four numbers we're dealing with are Joseph's birthdays, right? He was born on four different days in Thomas. Yeah. So you have the first of Tammuz. What did you say? I said it's a new, so like, yeah, that's the that's the, so the claim, so to speak. Yeah. So <clears throat> you'll see why, by the way. It, yeah. You know, this this is presented as an argument between the rabbis, but it's not, and you'll see right now why. So okay, so some so one opinion says he was born on the first of Tammuz, another opinion the second of Tammuz, another opinion on the seventh. Thomas and the another opinion is the 27th of Thomas. Okay. 
Hmm. So between the first and the second opinion, right? There's one because the first opinion is that he was born on the first and the second opinion he was born on the second. Hmm. So what's the difference between two and one? It's one. Yeah. Two minus one is one. Yeah. Okay. So fine. Now, what's the difference between the second and the third opinion? What's the difference between two and seven? Five, right? Yeah. Okay. And what's the difference between seven and 27? 20. 20. Okay. So now we have a new set of numbers that was formed by the difference in between these numbers. So you have one. Wait, what was it? Oh, one, five, and 20. Okay. That's the new set. Mm -hmm. Now, as we continue, one to five equals four. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we keep doing the same, you know, the, the, the same process. Okay, so between the one and the five, there's four. Okay, yeah, okay. Uh, oh, I lost my place. One second, one second. Uh, yeah, between the one and the five is four, and from five to 20 is 15. Okay, so now we have a new set four and 15. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the next set, right? Okay, so sorry, let me back. Now, and finally, from four to 15 is 11. Okay, so we create this kind of like pyramidal uh, pattern, right? Yeah. That starts off with four numbers, goes to three numbers, then goes to two numbers, and then goes to one number. Can you picture that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, if we had started with three, hold on a second. If we had started, okay, we had started with, Three numbers, if we had started with three numbers rather than four numbers, okay, we would have had a quadratic series, meaning that if it would have been translated into an algebraic formula, it has n to the two in it. Okay. But since we began with four different numbers, we have a cubic series, which is algebraically expressed as n to the three. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, let's see what will be the next number in the series. Obviously, the next number cannot be a date in Tamils. Mm -hmm. okay. So it goes well uh, that the number, one second, it goes well. It goes well over the 29 days of Tamils. So, so how do we calculate that? So we add the 11 back to the 15, okay, which is adding Yudhe to Vavhe, mm -hmm. okay, resulting in 26. Okay, so 11 is Vavhe, right? Vav plus He is 11. And Yudhe is 15. So when you add those together, resulting in 26. So like we're going backwards now. Like before we were minusing, now we're plusing. Okay. Then we add the 26 back to the 20 and we get 46, yeah. which is the filling in of Hashem's name, yud Hey vav Okay. Uh, okay, which is, or, or as we know in Hebrew, the Miloi of Hashem's name, okay? Uh, the, uh, the highest one of the four fillings. Okay, so this is the filling, this is the filling in of the, of the name, which equals 72. Shame ab, as they call it. Shame I and bet. Okay. Then we, we're almost at 37. Okay, relax. <laughs> then um, we take the 46 and add that mm -hmm. to the 27. Mm -hmm. Okay. Remember, these are we're working with the original figures here. Okay. Mm -hmm. So take the 46 and add that to the 27. And then we get the next number in the series, which is 73. Mm -hmm. okay. so 46 plus 27 is 73. Mm -hmm. 73 is I have in my notes here 70 that 73 is the gematry of Chachma. Can you confirm that for me, Greg? Okay. You have the Trugmans open, right? I'm um yeah. Uh so that's the best. I, don't, I do I do I do 73 is what in, in the in letters. Uh just I think it's I think it's uh uh het half one second mem hey uh, one second no, what do you mean? Wait, it's just it's just two two letters. 
No? Chachma? No, it's, it's four letters. I, oh, Chachma. I thought you meant. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hold on. But wait, it'll, it'll, if I put it in search, it'll give me the number? It'll give you the number too. So just type, just type head and then. One second. Half. One second. Head. Oops. Head. Uh, and half is, is, is uh, okay. I'm just doing Hebrew translate website. Okay. Okay. Head half. Head half mem hey. Hold on. Uh, mem. Actually calculate it. Okay. So. Hold on. Mem. Mem is 45. Mem and hey. 60. Where's the hey over here? Uh, H. Plus eight is 73. It is 73. I just did it in my head. Okay. I just uh, wanted to make sure. Oh, let me, let me just confirm that. Uh, I did in search. I just can't find what we're looking for. Where am I? Where should I go? Chachma is seventy three. I I I I am confident. In, in this website, where would I where would I look for to match? I'll show you next time. Oh, here. Oh, I, I should have gone to the Gematria table. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. But, uh, I just want to see for myself. Yeah, eight, eight, uh, and then plus twenty. That's twenty eight. Plus mem. 40, that's 98, plus hey is, hey is what? Five. Five, yeah. One, 103? No, no, listen. Oh. A head is eight and half is 20. Okay. okay. So that's 28. Uh -huh. Plus mem, mem that's, that's 68. That's four. That's 40. So that's 68. Oh, I'm sorry, 68. Yeah, yeah. So six, then 68 plus five is 73. Yeah, 73. Yeah. Okay, great. I don't know why I got yeah. Okay, so so minor rewind. Okay, 46 plus 27 equals 73. So 73 is the word chachma, mm -hmm. gematria of the word chachma. Mm -hmm. And uh, and there's something very wise about this series. Mm -hmm. From the four dates that we started with, mm -hmm. which are the birthdays of Yosef, right? So the, the next quote unquote theoretic number. These are all math terms that he uses, which I don't understand by the way. Yeah. Theoretic number is that uh, it implies uh, 73. So the gematria, which is the gematria of Chachma. Okay, so let's now summarize the numbers, all four numbers we began with. Theoretical began with. number is a, is a um, it's concerned, yeah, it's number theory. Uh, I just want to clarify for you what that is uh, into math a little bit. Uh, when you're talking about number theories, I don't know where he got this from. Devoted primarily to the study of integers and inter integer valued functions. Okay, so that's something else. Anyway, go on. Sorry about that. No problem. No problem. So, actually, I have written here theoretic, which is probably theoretic. I, write, I probably just didn't write it correctly. You, you just, Maybe theoretical okay. number. It's probably what you said. But anyway, moving on. Okay. All right. All right. So, so we have this uh, theoretic number. Okay, and that is implied. This number seventy-three, mm -hmm. the gematria of Kachma. So let's now summarize the numbers, um, all the four numbers that we began with, which are these dates and tamos, right? The first mm -hmm. of Tamas, the second of Tamas, the seventh of Tamas, and the 27th of Tamas. So check this out. The first three added up equal to 10, mm -hmm. right? Because one plus two is three, and three yeah. plus seven is 10. Okay. So, and this is, uh, this is, this corresponds to the 10th sphere row. Okay. Yeah. And it's even broken down like the chart is, but we'll, we'll see that in a second. Okay. All right, so one, right? The one by itself, that's Keter, mm -hmm. okay? Two is, is Chachma and Bina, mm -hmm. okay? And the seven emotive attributes, right? From Chesed to Malchut. So that, that, that's the whole, that's the breakdown right there. You have the Keter, which is a crown, which is not considered part of the allegorical body of the Sfirot, mm -hmm. right? But so then you have the first part of the body, which is the head. So, and the head has two spherot in it, Chachma and Bina. Okay, so that's two. 
and then you have a new section of the body, the torso. That's the seven emo, em, uh, the emotive attributes from chesed, which is basically chesed, gevura, ferret, netzachod, mm -hmm. yisod, and then and then malchut. Okay. So this this structure so far, this these 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 dates in tamos. The first of tamos, that's keter. The second of Tammuz, that's Chachma and Bina, two, right? Two, two spherot. And then the seventh of Tammuz, that is the, the seven lower spherot. Okay, moving on. Okay. Now, okay, so again, Keter is number one, Chachma, uh, sorry, two, one is Keter, two is Chachma and Bina, and then the, the seven emotive attributes from Chesed to Malk. Okay, now 10. Is then added to twenty-seven. Remember, twenty-seven is the last. Yeah. Twenty-seven is the is the last date, right yeah. in Tammuz. Yeah. So ten plus twenty-seven is thirty-seven. Nice. Okay, so that's a so all right. right. What, so what does that mean? We don't we haven't okay. So so thirty-seven is also the value of wisdom, in the ordinal numbering. Now this is cool. Now Gematria has. A number of different systems. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the ordinal gematria, so the ordinal numbers. So basically, there are 22 letters in the alphabet, right? Mm -hmm. So instead of focusing on the numerical value of each yeah. letter, we focus on its order. Yeah, position. Its position in yeah. the alphabet. Yeah. Like yeah. Alphabet. a number, a number defining, I think, its position in a series such as first, second, or third. Right. Order numbers are used as adjectives, nouns, or pronouns. So, so basically, uh, in regular gematria, mm -hmm. the, the, the last letter is, is 400. The numerical value of, of tav, the last letter, is 400. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, but in ordinal gematria, it's 22, because it's mm -hmm. the 22nd letter. Interesting. Yeah, okay. So in ordinal gematria, chachma, if you, if you take the, the letters by their position, Mm. It equals 37. Wow. Okay. Perfect. All right. So that's cool. But so what does it mean? All right. Let's move on. <laughs> okay. Now, when I add the 37, which is the, again, the ordinal gematria to the 73, mm -hmm. which is the regular gematria, mm -hmm. right? I get the sum of the first five numbers of the series, which equals 110. Okay. So there, there needs to be a little bit of background to that, but anyway, I'm gonna, I think he's gonna explain it up ahead. Mm -hmm. So 37 and 73 are the same two numerals reversed, by the way. So what does it have to do with Joseph? Right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of other questions, but that, that's the question he went to in the, in the, in the lecture. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was how long Joseph lived. Mm -hmm. He lived 110 years. Okay, so you have these, okay. Moving on. Nice. So we okay. So we see another beautiful phenomenon that uh, directs very that directs very simply to 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 Yosef. Yosef is a mathematician because his name means to add, right? Yosef, mm -hmm. he will add. Yosef, that's what it means. Yeah. I can't believe I didn't put that together immediately. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, to go further, let's review that we added 11 plus 26, which equals 37. Okay. Now we add 37 to the next number, mm -hmm. which is 46. So you guys would have to review what we spoke about, how we got, like how we started out with mm -hmm. the four dates. Then we took the, you know, we, the numbers that are in between those dates. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then we took the numbers in between those numbers. And we created this kind of like triangular type of pattern. And that's where those numbers came from. So mm -hmm. you'd have to review a little bit. Okay. So okay. just going back for a second. Now we add 37 to the next number, which is, which is 46. Okay. Which is the filling of the name Ab. Remember we were talking about before how yud Hey vav Hey has four different Nilui's? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I'm listening to you. You recall that? So yeah. The first Miloy is 72, right? Hello? Yeah. No, I'm there. I'm, 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 agreeing. I'm uh, acknowledging what you're saying. Oh, because I don't actually see 
I, okay, I'm, I, there it is. I, I put the video on. I wasn't oh. like I was just listening to you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're probably making you're probably making like you know like facial expressions. As yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, okay so, <laughs> so okay, so you have uh, yud hey vav hey when it's filled. Okay, uh, the first filling of it, it it becomes the gematria seventy two. Okay, now when you if you would remove just the first letters mm -hmm. in the in the miloy of that name, mm -hmm. right? Like you you remove the twenty six, so you, you you remain with forty six. Yeah. Right. Okay. So. So thirty seven plus forty six equals eighty three. Okay. So to continue, we take the eighty three and add it to seventy three. Hold on, hold on, and we get one hundred fifty six. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's that's the gematria of, of the name Yosef. Mm -hmm. If we continue with two more progressions in this pattern, we arrive at the number four hundred seventy seven. Holy crap, this gets really complicated. <laughs> I've been more like, yeah. you know, I wish this I could. Everything, this is everything written by Rob Ginsburg, right? Yeah, this, I, this is like verbatim from his lecture that I. From he's, the he's, he's, he's incredible. He's, he's, he's uh, Okay, so, so again, yeah. we started. So he has this like little thing. Okay, so check this out. We're going to do a quick little chart. Okay, so I wish I'm going to turn on the camera for a second. I'm going to turn off this. I want to see if you can. Get this, <laughs> and then okay. you get this. Hold on, do you okay. think? Do you think that he's one of the thirty-six? By the way, no. You don't think so? Right? No. Why is that? I'm not saying he's not a tzaddik, but I don't know. Well, because yeah, he's not secret. Yeah. yeah. Just saying because he's known, he's not yeah. one of the thirty-six. Or maybe, or maybe it's maybe he's hiding in plain sight. That's the best. I was going to say maybe. Uh, yeah, it could, it could be just like there, but we don't know. You know, we don't know if he is or not. So I, I suspect that he might. Be. I don't. Know. I have a weird feeling. Do you see that? What? Do you see? One second. Uh, yes, I can see it. Mm -hmm. Okay, hold on, hold on. Mm -hmm. There's like a little chart. Mm -hmm. Hang on a second. I I can't show the background because uh you know I have uh yeah. my wife might be walking around. And so she has her hearing aid out, so I'm not going to be yelling at her, telling her there's a camera. Yeah. So hold on a second. Mm -hmm. a moment. Okay, so right here we on caught, the bottom. One sec, we caught the we caught uh, the Loch Ness monster for one second. Do you see? There's like a little chart here. It shows yeah. like the. Yes. How, is that very clear? Yeah, more or less, yeah. So that that is what we were referring to. That's that's the numbers that we've been working with. Yeah. Started out with one, two, seven, and twenty-seven. Okay. So mm -hmm. that shows mm -hmm. what we've been looking at. So people could like pause that mm -hmm. for a moment and they could, you know, they could see it visually. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so hold on. And I'm back. Sort of. Okay. <laughs> All right. Have a part two. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, when Rachel gave birth to Yosef, mm -hmm. and this is discussed in, uh, in Genesis chapter 30, verse 24, Rachel said, may Hashem grant me another son. That's mm -hmm. what she said when Yosef was born. May, may Hashem grant me another son, mm -hmm. which, which seems odd. Wow. So, uh, so Yosef, Second, so basically in Hebrew, it's Yosef Hashem Li Bain Acher. Okay, that's oh. that. So, and the gematria of that entire phrase is 477. Okay. So, what does that mean? Okay, now if this series is calculated to 13 places, 13 is a very significant number, right? 13 principles of mercy. 13 attributes of, uh, of uh, 13 principles of faith. There's a lot of 13s, okay? Anyway, according to the rules of mathematics, the sum of all these 13 numbers will be a multiple of 13. So the sum of these 13 numbers is actually 9,100. Mm -hmm. So 9,100 is 13 times 700. Mm -hmm. So the average value of the first 13 numbers is 700, okay? So this number, 
9,100 is five times 1820. Have you heard about 1820? No, I have not. 1820 is the number of times Hashem's name appears in the whole Torah. Hmm. That's why, that's why 2018 was like a big, you know, like people were talking yeah. about. Oh, uh, okay. Interesting. Now, so 1820 can also be expressed as 70 times 26. Hmm. So 26 is Hashem's name, Havaya, as we know, right? Mm -hmm. so, so 26 times 70 is 1820, okay? Yeah. Uh, 1820, times five, 1820 times five is 9,100. Okay, okay, fine. Now, so what is the average value of the sum of the 13 numbers? One second, one second. What is the average value of the sum of the 13 numbers of the series have to do with Yosef? By the way, the sum of the, the average value of the sum of the 13 numbers uh, of this series is 700, by the way, but that's, so what, what does it have to do with Yosef? Okay, so the gematria of Yosef is 156, we mentioned that, which is 156 times Hashem's name. Okay, so, that, that, so 26 times six is 156. I may have screwed this up, but maybe not. Hold on. The gematria of Yosef is 156, which is six times Hashem's name. So 26 times six is 156. Okay. But 9,100 is also five times 70, which equals 350. 350 times 26 is 9,100. Okay. But the average value of, of 9,100 is 700. So Yosef is associated with the sphere of Yesod, foundation, mm -hmm. right? It's the, uh, it's the sphere that's right before Mal, okay? Mm -hmm. It represents the, the reproductive organ, yeah. okay? So Yesod is associated with the Brit Milah, that's what he says. So Yosef's main trial was about purifying and guarding his Brit Milah, okay? This is expressed with resisting the advances of Potiphar's wife. Yeah. Okay. That's why actually he's called Yosef Hatzadi. Yeah. Okay. Now, Yesod is a very interesting word. It reads like this, Yud, the letter Yud, and then the word Sod. Yud, Sod. Yeah. So Yud is 10, okay? So Yud is actually what it, you know, what it really looks like graphically. It's a dot, okay? That's what it, that, that's the way, it, it looks, Yud is just represented as a dot mm -hmm. that is formed with a point. You know, it has like a little, little coats, they call it, right? Yeah. Little, okay. Mm -hmm. A chupchik, they say in Russian. Mm -hmm. So Yud is like a dot, which is like a kernel that includes the essence of all the 10 spheros, which is why Yud is 10, by the way, in Gematria, okay? So Yud is followed by the three letters that form Sod. Okay, so sod means mystery. Okay, so there's an allusion to the 10 secrets in the word yesod. Okay, so uh, mystery and sphera are synonymous, okay, in Torah. Okay, mm. so basically the sphere of yesod is, can be looked at as the 10 secrets. It has within it the 10 secrets, the 10 sphero, okay, because it's all funneled through yesod. Okay, yeah. now, Okay, so there's an allusion to the 10 secrets in the word you sowed, you'd sowed secrets. Okay, now the 10 secrets are the sphero, which are concealed powers of the soul. So if any guys wanted to know, at least begin to know what the sphero really are, they are the 10 powers of the soul, okay? That we have to manifest, okay? And, uh, and reveal in our service of God. Mm -hmm. Okay, so these are powers that we manifest, we reveal them while we're serving God. So mm -hmm. when, when we summarize all the qualities in all the stories about Yosef, and also what it means when all of us have a spark of Yosef, right? So, so the tzaddik inside, uh, we are all, in reality, we are all tzaddikim. We all have a spark of Yosef. So mm -hmm. the very essence of Yosef is the ability to reveal the depths of the subconscious, uh, which, by the way, in Hebrew, 
the subconscious, like in, a, in Kabbalistic parlance, is called the Hoshech. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right, which is darkness, right? Yeah. That's yeah. the subconscious, okay? Mm -hmm. to, bring it, to bring it to the forefront of consciousness, which is like, you know, if you look at the beginning of the Torah, it says, and Hashem said, let there be light, right? But there was darkness before yeah. that. So, so consciousness came forth from the subconscious. That's the light that he was talking about, okay? Now, Yosef is all about revealing secrets, okay? Remember what they called him? Remember what Paro called him? Sofnat Paneach, right? The yeah. revealer of secrets. Yeah. Okay, so the one point of, of Yosef is the power of the soul to reveal secrets. Now, okay, everyone has a secret, okay? And everyone has 10 secrets, okay? And Yosef is the foundation which alludes to the ability to reveal all of them, okay? The word secret, sod, right, which is spelled samach vav dalit, is gematria 70. If you have 10 secrets, then you have 70 times 10, okay? And that's 700. And there's that average value of the 13, of those, of the 13, of those 13 numbers that we talked about. If you rewind this, you'll, you'll see, okay, later on. Okay, hold on, hold on. So, so let's recall that the series of numbers that we derived from the four dates of Joseph's birth, uh, the first 13 numbers derived have an average value of 700. Okay, so again, the word sowed is 70 and yesod is 80. But if you look at yesod, like we did before, it's spelled yud, which is the letter, just the letter by itself. And then the word sowed and yud is 10. So you could look at it, the word itself as 10 secrets. Yud sowed. Okay. okay. So it reads yud sowed, okay, which can be read as 10 secrets. Now, and it can also be read algebraically as sowed times yud. The word sowed times yud equals 700, okay? Mm -hmm. So 700 means 10, like 10 secrets, which give us uh, information about the sphere of Yisrael, okay? Which, it, which, which in turn is the light and the foundation of Yosef. Okay, now, Hasid, Hasidut says, that if you fall in love with something, it's very hard to leave it. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to leave this series that we just defined. <laughs> yeah. So what we, what we are doing now with these numbers is called discrete calculus. Yeah. This was studied and defined by Newton. How to translate our series into algebraic expression, uh, which is a cubic expression. Mm -hmm. okay. It's not easy and it's not too hard either. Okay, so the algebraic expression is 11 times n to the third minus 21. Ah, hell, I'll just show you. <laughs> Tell me if you could see that. Let me see. Uh, yes. Okay. Going back. Okay. I'm back. Okay. Okay. So uh, now, okay. Now, if n equals seven, then the result is Yosef Li Ben Acher, which, which is 477. That's exactly the gematria of Rachel's statement about him. Mm -hmm. This is gonna have to, when I first heard this, it took me, cause I'm not, I'm not, I love math, I'm just not good at it. And it took me a long time to let this sink in. And it's just incredible. Anyway, if we have four possible, again, we're going back to these four possible dates for the birthday of Yosef. It must be a structure in and of itself. The Torah always alludes to the four letters of Hashem's name, Havaya, okay? So how can you be born four days or four times all in the month of Thomas, right? How can you have, you can't be born four times. So, so we have an important principle that when there are more than one opinion in the Torah, we say these and these are the words of the living God. Mm -hmm. okay? So whenever there are opinions that differ from each other, all of them are true on some level of reality. Yeah. Okay? So they're not different opinions. They're showing you different angles of the same creature. 
Now, so we then must say that the first of Tammuz is wisdom being born, which is the yud of his soul, okay? Every soul is a chalik havaya, is a portion of, of, of yud he vav he, right? Which, which is four letters representing four levels. So Yosef's wisdom is born on the first of Tammuz. His understanding, okay, uh, which is the hey of God's name, is born on the second of Tammuz. Okay, so these two days are consecutive, just like Chachma and Bina are consecutive. Okay, so there's that consecutive relationship. Okay, so, uh, so Chachma and Bina are two companions that actually never separate. Okay, the fact that we know that you know there are two different things is only because. God tells us that, but if we were ever to experience Chachma and Bina directly, we would see it a united thing. We couldn't necessarily tell there's two different things. So they're very close to one another. They're consecutive. First comes Chachma, and then immediately goes Bina. Okay. Now, then the seventh of Tammuz represents the lower emotive sphero, the, meaning the rest of the sphero, from Chesed to Malchut. Okay. And that corresponds to the Vav in Chavaya. Okay, uh, one second. I put a star here, an asterisk. That usually means that this is my, I included my own speculation in here. So I'm trying to see <laughs> how to skip it. Okay. Okay. Ah, hell, I'll just read it. My I friend, do you know how we're bringing light into the world? Really quickly, I just want to read this to you. I, I'd like to know. Um, you know this guy, Aaron Siri. He's a lawyer. He's the guy that filed the the uh, the motion, you know, for for, for the FDA to to release Schmeiser COVID data, Schmeiser Schmexin data, the ones that wanted to, you know, five hundred pages a month. They want they wanted like seventy five years. So he just wrote. The lawyer wrote, "I am pleased to report that a federal judge rejected." The F FDA's request to produce the Schmeiser Schmexin data at 500 pages a month instead and instead ordered a rate of 55,000 pages per month, which which means that what does that mean? That they will need here uh, 75 years. So basically, uh, we've reduced that to. Um, so how many months is this is going to take? It's going to take. How many pages is this total? Uh, 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 this was originally here. Uh, 5,500 pages a month, 12 months times, uh, here, correct. 500 pages a month. Ah, come on. Uh, times 12, uh, 6,000 times 75, 450,000 pages. So now you get, divide that by 55,000 pages a month. It's going to take, Eight months, only eight months, and not 75 years to release all the Schmeiser data. Only eight months, huh? According, uh, it's, it's better than 75 years. I wish they would release it now. Uh, immune mediated hepatitis with Moderna Schmexine, no longer a coincidence, but confirmed. Our case demonstrates conclusive evidence that Schmexine induced immune mediated hepatitis which my father had, he had hep C, which is an immunodefic immunodeficiency, one of the things, syndrome, with a rapid onset of liver after the first Moderna, which on re-exposure led to acute severe autoimmune hepatitis. This is Journal Hepatology, Europe. Incredible. Incredible. It's just, it's just, no words. However, there is a win for the good guys. I want to, hold on, I want to see if he actually outlines, here you go. Uh, serious issues, ta, ta, ta. Yeah, well, it's bad enough that the government violated this basic liberty right by mandating this schmexine. Government also want to hide the data by waiting to fully produce what it relied upon to license this product until almost every American alive today is dead. That form of governance is destructive to liberty and antithetical to the openness required in a democratic society. 
Uh, and now he's getting to James Madison, order, here you go. Here's the actual order. Uh, blah, blah, blah. There's like society. Okay, this is like what the judge cited. Oh, okay. The F, the, oh, FEDA, here you go. Shall produce the more than 12,000 pages articulated in its own proposal. Uh, on or before, on or before January 31st, 2020, whoa, 2022, the FEDA shall produce the remaining documents at a rate of 55,000 pages every 30 days, with the first production being due on or before March 1st, 2022, until production is complete. My friend, do you know Purim's coming up March 17th? To the extent the FEDA asserts any privilege, exemption, or exclusion to their... Da, 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 Uh, the party should submit a joint status report detailing the progress of the rolling production by April 1st and every 90 days thereafter. So ordered on the 6th day of January 2022. Bingo, bango, bongo. Things and stuff. Stuff and things. Check and mate. I don't know, man. It sounds, eight months sounds more like checkmate on us. But, uh, I think, well, it's better than 75 years. But, well, I think, I think can, can I tell you something? I think by the time the first two couple of months or three months roll by, we're going to see something in there. I'm telling you, I, have, I'm, I just have this very, I get these like, you know, it's like when I used to trade stocks, I just get these premonitions. I get this intuition, premonitions. And I'm, and I'm getting like Purim over here. That's what I'm getting. You know, and then oh, as, as my as my Yemenite business partner used to say, Greg, we just need to hold. We just need to. It sounds funny, but I don't know what, what he actually said. Well, what's the he last? Means we just need to wait. We just need to hold on for you know a certain amount of time. In this case, two months. Yeah. You know, that, that's just my, listen, I, I could be wrong. I have a weird feeling about this, man. I have a weird feeling about this. You know, the, this, this lady, our friend Rachel, the one that follows her, she yeah. wrote this, she wrote the following on my wall. I don't know if you read this. Uh, this is very interesting. I, I, I posted about, you know, the, the Arab MK speaking Arabic in the Knesset. And she wrote the following response. Uh, just as prophesies and likely meets its endpoint on Tu B'Shvat, that should mark both, uh, she's talking about the, this government falling on Tu B'Shvat, mark the nine-month mark of its purpose of endurance and the end of the Karen Kayemet of Edom. Uh, and then somebody asked her, what, do you, what does that mean? And she goes, prophecy foretold nine months of Arab domination soon before Mashiach. This Tu B'Shvat is the both Shemitah and uh, three, three, you know, 3,333 years since Matan Torah. That is significant as the 33rd Shari Toma is the boundary. Interesting. And the tipping point is the, in the precarious balance, speaking of your, th your 33, uh, between Edom and Israel. This government goes down with Edom. For more on this, go to Days of Awe Blogspot. There's more. Ah, so this is the guy. What's his name? Uh, there's more, but I have not to explain it here. This is the guy. Uh, no. Uh, this guy, Dov Barlaib. He writes about this whole stuff. You might enjoy his blog. I don't know if you ever read it. I think I looked at it. Uh, here, and yeah, it's whatever. Uh, yeah, it, it, this is a very long blog post, but it's titled here. The title is 3,333.33 3, years after Matantara, the loss of Hadar grandness at Chod, that is in Chod part two. This is in November, he wrote this. Uh, so I'm just going to scan through and tell you what the kits are of this whole thing is. He gets into all these different, uh, you know, uh, Kabbalah, Gematria, all these uh, Sifirot, wonderful. Uh, yeah, he goes, uh, what's important to us since Jews are still scattered all over the world since the destruction of the first temple is, is, is if we work on ourselves every year, they're in Sefirot the Omer, turning every intersection between our animal, Nefesh, and Divine Nefesh from Tameh to Tahor, from impure to pure. One day for each of these 49 intersections, how long would it take for the entire nation of Israel to do the same scattered all over the world in all, to, all 24 time zones? So now it gets into this whole like, 
Well, it's true. During the Second Temple, most of the world Jews from Southern Kingdom were in Babylon, not in Eretz Israel, with pockets of Jewish exiles in Yemen, uh, in Greek-controlled Egypt, and in parts of Germany. Northern Kingdom Israelites were in Ethiopia, and in cities mentioned in Tanakh, there were in northeastern corners of Assyrian Empire. From there, according to some, many of the Assyrian exiles were absorbed by Turkic tribes that migrated into Afghanistan and into the land between the Black and Caspian Seas and became part of Khazaria. The point being, during the Second Temple period, the bulk of Judean exiles, including most of Benjamin, Shimon, and Levi, in large numbers were either in what is modern-day Iraq or in Iran. Some, of course, did return to Eretz Israel with Zerubbabel, and after the Second Temple was built, but the majority stayed behind in Babel and Persia and Yemen. But during these three pilgrimage festivals, they would even come from Babylon and Egypt, as, it, as is required if you are within, within reasonable walking distance. To be honest, it seems to make sense that they would have to make a two-week trip for Pesach and Sukkot. Home to the Pesach in just a couple of years ago, so all this stuff. Uh, but I wanted to get to the Bikitzer of this. Uh, here. Uh, probably. There was a whole specific thing that was very interesting. Uh, one second. I want to get to it. I, I, I read it before a long time ago. Here you go. Reagan. Okay. Here you go. Speaking of Reagan. Uh-huh. So he's talking about all these different things, whatever. Has the world been purified and refined for all mankind one level every century? So, the, so first, let us skip forward exactly 3,300 3, 3, years to see if Asaph at that moment in time tried to build that proverbial roof with no holes in it, a gog built by Gog, because of his desire to no longer serve God above the 33rd level of purity. Did this leader try to build a world order which prided itself on how well mankind could govern the affairs of men without relying on the assistance of a divine being. So let us skip from the year 2449 to exactly 3,300 3, years into the future and reach the year 5749 or the fall of 1988, according to the Gregorian calendar. Lo and behold, Ronald Reagan was leaving the office of the US presidency after two full terms. At this time in Israel, the first intifada had been taking place for a year already. And since Reagan was beginning to lose his mental faculties in the, in the very last year of his eight-year president, eight presidencies, presidency, uh, uh, a new, more oppressive foreign policy on Carlos Royal was beginning to emerge from the benign years of Secretary of State George Schultz and U.N. Ambassador Jean Kirkpatrick. Kirkpatrick. <clears throat> that new foreign policy was coming from the Vice President heir apparent and eventually elected Gog <laughs> Herbert Walker Bush Sr., that's what he calls him. And precisely on schedule, the man who would declare a Masonic Novus Ordo Seclorum, a new world order, he actually said it in a speech, we know that, Yep. Before the UN in 1990, on the eve of the first Persian Gulf War against Saddam Hussein, was elected president of the United States on November 8th of 1988, 29th of Heshbon, 5749, exactly 3,300 years after 2449. Given that Saddam Hussein was assuredly the Gilgal of Nebuchadnezzar, he actually thought he was, who destroyed the first temple, a long war would ensue between Gog Bush Sr., 41, Papa, and his son Gog, Gog W. Ben Gog Jr., 43 lasting 17 years with a break in between for Clinton presidency before Saddam was eventually executed on the 9th of Tevet. Wow. What? Did you know this? I, I didn't. Saddam was executed on the 9th of Tevet. 5767 by a tribunal run by Iraq's interim government with the full support of President Gog, son of Gog Bush Jr. to fulfill the pasuk from Jor Yirkras, third verse that we sing every Shabbat tread the wine press in the city of Basra and also in Babylon, which arose to be strong. Now I am fully aware that the Asaf angel was represented by Tony Blair's British army contingent was not uh, executed in Basra by the Persian supporting Shiites at the end of that Shemitah cycle. But that was because of our own sins of evacuating Jewish Gaza in the middle of that cycle in 57, 65, 2005 in the horrible thoughtless Khurban, which delayed the Geula from that seven year Shemitah cycle. Interesting. But the two Gogs had at least partially fulfilled their purpose in the history of mankind, representing the God-fearing leadership of Edom when he thinks he has a divine right to rule and reshape the world without the constant providence of God himself. What is key and seminal to know is that the new world order they, that they tried and are still trying to propagate on mankind is an affront to God in heaven, an attempted world government without God as a supreme authority to run the world under his rules 
and un under the rules of Gog or any of his lieutenants in bankster positions <laughs> that control the rigged asset markets, rigged since 2008, I think longer than before that, or in positions relating to world government. And like clockwork, he had appeared precisely right on the schedule 3,300 years or 33 centuries starting after the Rosh Hashanah, 2449, immediately after Matan Torah. 33 centuries after 2449 was the fall of 1988 when Gog Bush Sr. was elected president of the United States. Uh, other landmarks along the way. But to be honest, we should see other pieces of evidence that this is the pattern that history has followed. Other proofs that as we reach certain century markers. So in the same way, that at the end of 33 centuries marks the end of the matrix diagonal eigen value of Chod. My God, this guy's on another level. That is in Chod, let us start at the very beginning. The exodus from Egypt marked the jump off point from the first level of purity that in that if we had fallen below that level, we would have been irredeemable. And he gets to the 49th level of Tumor. So if we mankind started at the level in 2448, centuries of progress, uh, to rise above this level began in 2449, especially since after Matan Torah, we wasted most of the rest of that year with the sin of the golden calf 40 days later and the loss of God's benevolence and guiding mercy for an addition and additional 40 days until Rosh Chodesh Elul 2448. Uh, it gets into more things and stuff over here. One second. Um, I just want to get to the part about Israel and the government here. Uh, this in future, the next stuff is. Uh, Greek wisdom, wonderful, fantastic. Teshuva. My God, this is a, such a long like, thing of a Bob he gets into. But ah, oh, this here he talks about. So if Asa had repented of his lawless ways, was ways within three whole, I guess, years, it would be as if he had truly risen three more levels, Be'ahava, to the 33rd level of purity and wholesomeness and in righteousness, and perhaps. His mahut would be eternal or at least would last another full century. But as history shows, that is not what occurred. The third tear welled up in his eye, and during the 33rd century after, after Mantan Torah, Edom entered a steep period of moral decline. That's starting with Daddy Bush. I think on a basic spiritual level, Ace of realized where history was headed with the founding of the United States of America in 1776. 1776 is before 1789 when its constitution was ratified in 1776 is at the end of the 31st century after Matan Torah between 1688 and 1788. For the first time, Esau as a civilization was going to at least attempt to serve God out of love, a true repentance out of love to our Father in heaven. Anyone who has read about the history of American colonies and the two generations leading up to the revolution in 1776 knows about the Great Awakening and can testify to the fact that Great Awakening was an attempt to repent to God out of love. I would suggest reading about the Great Awakening in order to fully grasp the spiritual revolution starting around 1730, instigated by people like Jonathan Edwards and George Whitefield to grasp the extent of the spiritual revolution of the budding of American nation as a nation under God, not a nation under Yoshka per se, and how that preceded America as a nation at least by at least one generation. It is in this first Great Awakening that America as an exceptional nation received its mantle and its blessing for success. To fully understand the founding of America, one must first grasp the innovative novelty of, of this awakening, awakening. Now the reason for its importance is because the Great Awakening was the engine and the fuel for the next three centuries, the 31st and the 32nd and the 33rd centuries after Matan Torah. If America were to succeed in her mission statement of serving God to bring about the never-ending prosperity, it would have to morally grow and succeed for all three of these centuries until 1788. From 1789 until, 19, uh, until 1888, and from 1889 until 1988, when Gog Bush was elected president. Well, it seemed to be holding its own until the sexual revolution that I discussed in detail is another post. I will not spend a lot of time here discussing the stages of moral collapse that began to occur right after World War I, you know, the Roaring Twenties. Uh, yeah, Roaring Twenties. But the whole, the more notable collapse that began in the mid 60s is the one that proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that Asaf never intended to fully serve God up to the 33rd level. About two-thirds through of that 33rd century, the morality of his once great national nation fell into ruin. Maybe it started with the iconic Phil Rebel Without a Cause in 1955, James Dean film on rebelling against God that grew from that moment in time, which was most, almost precisely two-thirds of the way through that 33rd century. America would make it until 1988, but it would be at the point of a steep moral decline that it's taken root 33 years earlier. Now it gets into this, the pyramid and the, on the money, Freemasonry. And this is interesting. You should, I will send this to you. You should like reading this. Ah, here you go. Uh, 
Now, originally, many of America's founding fathers did not want this to be a symbol of the United States, or at least they did not want this to be a symbol on any one of Americans' uh, national emblems, talking about the pyramid. Benjamin Franklin preferred that the reverse of the Great Seal should be Moses parting the Red Sea, speaking of next week's Parsha, with the children of Israel crossing the sea with the caption, Rebellion to Tyrants is Obedience to God. Thomas Jefferson preferred that the front of the Great Seal should be a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day, leading the children of Israel in the wilderness. Yes, these were some real proposals by some of America's founding fathers. All of the themes were biblical themes for Hebrew scripture, but none of these proposals was accepted by the bulk of America's founding fathers. What seemed to attract them was a reverse that is strikingly similar to the unfinished pyramid above. What is noteworthy about symbol uh, is number one, Novus Order Seclorum, the Latin words for the English New World Order, with Gogbur Sr. declared before the UN at the onset of the First Persian Gulf War in 1990. Number two, but what is more striking that if you measure it with a ruler, the unfinished pyramid is precisely cut off at the through two thirds more of the pyramid is a pagan eye of Isis, an Egyptian of Orzora based on the actual wife of Nimrod, a subject that I do not want to tackle here, but just to say she rebelled against God just like her husband and controlled Nimrod's uh, world government by using dark occultic arts and Nimrodian courts, which accounts for the title Diana or Diana, which was her title as the head of Nimrod's courts. Again, not getting deeply into this, into this ISIS, but her eye is on the reverse seal of the United States and on the $1 bill. So it deserves a mention, lest people think that there's anything kosher about this American national symbol. Then there is Anuit Coeptis, which means supposedly that someone, Isis or God, is smiling on our efforts. What a seal. So here we go. Asaph rises to a level which is equivalent of two-thirds of the way to Sinai, which turns out to be either two-thirds of 49 equals 32 and two-thirds level of 30, which represents our efforts, or two-thirds of 50, which is 33.33333, whatever, which is two-thirds of America's attachment to infinity and permanent prosperity. In reality... By studying the history of the 20th century, a dome reached his zenith in the 1950s in America, two thirds of the way uh, to 49, up to the 33rd level of purity. Then he declared his new world order 3,300 years after Matantara in 1990. But in reality, his new world order will only last to the 33.333 level of purity or 3,333.33 3, years after Matantara, even if the last 50 years of, his, of this process have represented a dome in steep, steep spiritual decline. And his maximum use date or the time of his collapse is when he is at the 33.3 level of purity or 3,300 after Matan Torah, at which point he can no longer lead mankind. I did not discuss Evergrande, which is their symbol in the Hong Kong exchange, 3333.hk, listed on the Hong Kong exchange in this post. If it unfolds and shows itself to be the linchpin behind the collapse of Karen Kayemet and so-called stock market in Alama Zeh by Tubish Shvat, I will write about it in part three. So he's waiting now. But this post covers my thought process for the last 10 years, where I, where I verily believe that Edom's Be'ita date of collapse would be 3,333 years, when, and uh, one-third years after the Rosh Hashanah that would follow Matan Torah in 2448. What do you think, sir? Hello. Are you asleep? I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. Just getting out what do you here. think of this whole exposition? Three, thirty-three, three, three, three. It's a, no, it's amazing. I, I, I love it. It was awesome. You're talking about George Bush. I mean, I know about this whole George. Yeah, there you go. Fifty-seven, eighty-one. So, so, I mean, we're already at fifty-seven, eighty-two. So, ah, okay. So it's got to be in another point three, three, three. So he's talking about two. He's talking about two Bishvat of of like coming up. No, send me the link. I definitely want to read that. Yeah, I'm gonna send you this this, this post. I mean, there's a part one, part two, whatever. He's going to write part three, I guess, after Tu Bishvat. He'll get into it. Yeah, there's a, actually, there's two parts. I'm going to send you, yeah, the expiration date on Malchut Edom. That's the first part of what he wrote. It's very, these things are very long. It's almost like pamphlets or books he's writing. Yeah, here, the crunch time, the last trimester of the final nine months. This is, this, he talks about like uh, Rosh Hashanah next year. Yeah, crazy stuff. Some people may say, you know, like you said yesterday, we're not allowed to calculate this and that and the other, but... Uh, not a, I mean, we're at... I mean, look, he lived a thousand years ago, and yeah. but we're at the end of the calendar now. Yeah. It's a little, it's a, it's a little different. Yeah. Here, I'm going to send you part one and part two on WhatsApp. You will enjoy this uh, reading. I, I don't know. I'm for. I'm. I'm just excited to see what's going to happen here. 
in general. I mean, uh, yesterday, Naftali Bennett almost got into a fisticuffs with, you know, the opposition, as it were. And, uh, and, then, and then Arabs came out and spoke Arabic in the Knesset, which is, I think, one of the low points of Jewish history. <laughs> I mean, and that people were yelling at them, like, you know, well, but the better, you know, speak Hebrew. Yeah. It's, it's, it's so sad. It's so freaking sad. It's just, I don't even know what to say to that. But uh, what do you think in general, though, about this whole Bush thing and and, and, and Asaf supposedly, Asaf supposedly devolving in the 50s and 60s and all that kind of stuff? I mean, it checks out if you think about it, you know? It's uh, a lot of what a lot of what you read. I, I've heard, I've yeah. heard it from multiple sources. Uh, it seems it, it definitely makes sense. It it seems to add up to align very nicely with uh, yeah. you know with these you know Torah ideas, these verses, um, these midrashim. Yeah. Um, and no, I mean, it, I, I like I like that kind of precision very much. But uh, as Rabbi Kessin says, uh, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see what happens. Yeah. I want to read to you. There's actually the part of the nine months thing. Of, By the way, I'd just like to point out, yeah. uh, you completely, you, you, you smashed into my lecture. I'm very sorry. No, no, listen. <laughs> no, hold on, hold on. I, was no, just, but... I just thought it was funny. No, I, I, I was on the last, there, oh, there's no way you could have known this, but I was on the last paragraph of the I'm lecture. I'm very sorry. It completely, there's no possible way I could finish the lecture. And the only way to do it, I, I'd ha I would have to redo the whole lecture, which I'm not oh, going to do. I'm, I'm very sorry. So if everybody... I just wanted to say that one small thing. And then when I ran into like this other whole tangent of, of that. Which is, which is fine, which is fine. Can I, can think, I just try? You know, okay. No, you know, how I, you know how I take stuff like that? Yeah. I used to, I guess when I was like younger, when I was trying to say stuff like to my family, yeah. Since I'm the youngest, yeah. and they didn't think, nobody thought anything of just interrupting me randomly, I know. like in the middle of a, a middle of the story, showing how, yeah. Yeah. you know, how unimportant they felt that it was, right? Yeah. yeah. And then pinching me on the cheek. So, yeah. and I, you know, and as I got older, I was wondering, what is God trying to tell me? Yeah. And uh, I'm still wondering, yeah. but it's definitely a message from God, yeah. and. I think that, I think the main message is that sometimes information gets to people yeah. that it's meant to get to, and information doesn't get to people when it's not meant to get to them. Yeah. And that's it. It's simple as that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to read you this one part. You are, no, you're absolutely right. I, I, had, I have the same experiences. Um, he's talking about this is a pre post about the nine months of uh, this whole process and he got into ah yeah I think I read this to you before uh, the last six years yeah he's, he's talking, he, this is him writing in October so he's talking about like the last six years the entire world is like a spiritual Mad Max movie uh, the first six years of a truly dystopian Shemitah cycle. It is the seventh year of this degenerate cycle that through divine justice, God himself brings the entire world back into balance, not just by balancing off the seventh year with equal purity against the forces of darkness that are categorized the last six years. But through divine justice, the forces of purity must be at least sixfold greater than the deficit for each, each year of the previous six years. In short, in the Shemitah year 5782, purity must come roaring back sixfold to counter the deficit for the last six years plus an additional measure to count on the deficit between evil and good in the Shemitah year itself. That is the sevenfold magnification of purity over impurity that Rashi was talking about. So the question is, I mean, like we've already been in, yeah, it says, uh, just like in Yeshayahu, the entire year for the 782 will be, will be a year of recompense for the cause of Tzion. Okay, so we're waiting. Huh. I mean, I guess, you know, well, a new year of, for trees is to Bishrat, so. But, uh, I don't know. We'll see. 
it's interesting this whole three 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 thing and three and two thirds and point three three whatever what do you think yellow oh you're muted <laughs> I was muted. I'm, I'm literally oh answering you. I'm answering. Oh, you. what do you what do you think? Sorry. <laughs> I was like, I was like, whenever you have the number 33 involved. Yeah. Then, uh, uh, there's something going on there. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, something, that's, is, something is going on. There. That's what I can. That's what I can. I can assure you. OK. I was disappointed greatly because, you know, with three, 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 right? Years from Matan Torah, yeah. I felt like the positive, you know, it seemed to be a, a tremendous thing that's happening, but it looks really bad. It's a very unpleasant thing. Yeah. It's not exactly what I was hoping for, to put it mildly. Something massive yeah. occurred. Yeah. This debacle that we call, we now live in a banana republic. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it didn't have to be that way. Yeah. Okay. A transition must occur. I'm not disagreeing yeah. with that. Yeah. Okay. But it didn't have to, there's always a positive way for it to occur. There's always a loving way that it can happen. It didn't yeah. have to be like this. Yeah. And uh, so it's obviously, it's, it's, it's very, you know, it's funny. I was watching your brother's, uh, one of his lectures, he was talking about how, how, where the name Banana Republic came from. He was talking about the, the whole thing of the, the Guatemala and the bananas thing, and you know the quercetin whole situation, because you know quercetin comes from bananas. I didn't catch that. No, no, it's about like how America got uh, re, not compensed, but like recaptured their banana supply with the whole thing of like Guatemala being. He was, he was talking to the one of these guys, uh, the the root and branch, you know, the guys in Jerusalem. Yeah. Just talking about Guatemala and how America got their Guatemala source back from by basically organizing a coup. And he's talking about uh, uh, how uh, Edward Bernays, you know, the guy who founded PR, the whole concept of PR was yeah. that the guy who was doing the PR for like uh, this taking over of Guatemala. And he goes, oh, by the way, Edward Bernays, uh, who was a fan of Edward Bernays or who copied Edward Bernays, Goebbels. Yeah. And take a look at what's going on today with all this PR stuff and BS. Yeah. But, uh, yes, I didn't know about, I didn't know that that's what banana, Repu the, the term banana republic came, I mean, apparently, uh, come, you know, this whole thing of uh, Guatemala. Let's see. Uh, term. The, the, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Directory, yeah, especially in Central America, that is politically unstable and has an economic dominated by foreign interested interests usually depend on one export, such as bananas. Yeah. <laughs> um, but where did it actually? Yeah, oh, Henry coined the term to de describe Honduras and neighboring countries under economic exploitation by U.S. corporations, such as United Fruit Company, now Chiquita Brands International. Will, William Sidney Porter, better na name is O'Henry. This is the guy that came up with this term. But the question is like, are we really, I mean, I guess it is a banana republic, but what is it, what are we exporting? <laughs> That's the question. What is America exporting? To Culture, uh, yeah. Yeah. ideas. Uh, well, we're not, we should be exporting uh, technology and engineering, but it's, it's just being stolen from us. So you could, that's a form of export. Yeah. China. Yeah. It's crazy. Anyway, sir. Is there anything uh, in the last paragraph that you said you were, you were trying to finish? <laughs> is there anything that we can, like, what, what is the, <laughs> This is the opposite of strike while the iron is hot. Let me see if I could, oh, if man. I could let's see if I could perform Tahir Samasim here for a second. Yeah.
Okay. <clears throat> so if we recall, we started with these four dates that yeah. Yosef was supposed to be born on in the month of Thomas. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the first, the first one was, well, the first of the month of Thomas, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so that he was comparing that to the first letter of God's name, Yud A Vav He, right? So 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 it's the Yud, okay, which which overall represents Chachma. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then you have the second opinion, which is that Yosef was born on the second of Thomas. So that that represents the Hey of God's name. Mm -hmm. right? And hey, by the way, also it represents Bina. Okay. So then you have the next, the next date, the next opinion that Yosef was said to be, the date that he was said to be born on was the seventh of Thomas. Okay. So, uh, mm -hmm. so that represents the rest of the Spiro. Actually, it represents the, uh, the Vav in God's name. Yeah. And it, it represents from Chesed all the way until Yisod, which is about to join with Malchus. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. so, so that's the seven. That's that seventh of Thomas. Okay? Yeah. Again, that's the seventh of Thomas corresponds to the Vav of God's name, mm -hmm. which is the sixth Spirot from Chesed to Yisod, which is about to join Malchut, which would be the seventh sphere, okay? Yeah. And, then, and then now, this is where we're gonna finish off with this, mm -hmm. with this lecture, okay? Mm -hmm. So it says that, uh, okay, so now this is going to, oh no. Wait, I'm gonna find it, I'm gonna find it. I found it, I found it, okay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so. Okay, and finally, uh, Yosef's Malchut. Okay, that's the, that's the last hay of God's name. So he merited to be a king, if you recall. Mm -hmm. Even though his essential property is Yesod, which is, which is foundation, right? Mm -hmm. He became the first viceroy. And actually, after the Pharaoh passed away, I didn't know this until I heard this. He mm. actually became the king. He was, Yosef became actually the full pharaoh of Egypt for a, for a period of time. Did you know that? Yeah, a little, like, for sure. You heard yeah. that before? Yeah. I, yeah. Never, yeah. I thought he was the viceroy. I didn't know yeah. he actually became the full pharaoh for some period. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, that, so, so that's, that's Malchut, right? That's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the Malchut aspect of, of Yosef, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah. Okay, so, he, so he merited to become a king, even though his essential property is just so foundation. So first he became the viceroy of, of Egypt, and then he became, the, and after the pharaoh passed away, he became the full pharaoh of Egypt. So Yosef represents the idea of a tzaddik becoming a king. Mm -hmm. Okay? That, it, it, he represents the concept of, of, of that, okay? Yeah. Uh, king David, he represents the concept of the essential king. Okay, just the, you know, the, the concept of king itself. But Yosef represents this transitionary period of a, of a tzaddik who then becomes a king. Okay? Not to say that David wasn't a tzaddik, of course he was, but we're talking about kind of archetypical ideas. Okay. So, so, that's, okay, so that's what we're looking forward to right now. Uh, we want a tzaddik to become a king. Okay, so... Rebirth is preceded. He's he's referring to the Rebbe, by the way. Yeah. And he says, "What this is what we're looking forward to. We're looking forward to the Re to the Rebbe, who is the tzaddik, who yeah. actually becomes assumes the you know the crown, assumes the the throne." Okay. Yeah. So now, so every birth is preceded by a pregnancy in the womb. Joseph is the one important soul in the Torah that spent twelve years of his life in prison. Okay. So. All, tzaddi all tzaddikim that merit to be in prison are definitely related to Yosef. So obviously he's referring to the Chabad Rebbeim, like the Alter Rebbe, and more specifically, the Friedeke Rebbe, Rabbi Yosef Yitzhak. Mm -hmm.
Uh, so there's a verse about Yosef in the book of Kohelet, okay? the book of Kohelet, uh, which is written by Shlomo Melek. So mm -hmm. it says, from prison, he came out to rule. He doesn't give, uh, somebody knows Kohelet really well, they can provide the mm -hmm. plastic, but uh, I don't have it here. So anyway, the transformation of a tzaddik to a king was from the, the merit of him being in prison. So there's something about a tzaddik being in prison which propels him to becoming a king. Yeah. Okay, there's a pattern there. It's related. Okay. Yeah. Right. So Joseph's experience in prison is just like uh, the Jews that were enslaved in Egypt. He represents the exile of the whole Jewish people. The whole land of Egypt was like a prison. No one could escape from Egypt. In Kabbalah, it says that the prison of Egypt is like a womb, and the Jewish people were trapped in that womb for 210 years before the Exodus. So Exodus is the, is the birth of the Jewish people. Joseph was in his womb in this prison, right, for 12 years before he was born and then transformed into a king. So the womb is the foundation of the mother, right? The yesod of the mother uh, in the terminology of the Kabbalah. So, so Yosef is the person in the Torah that experiences prison, but he keeps his spirits high and while in prison finds favor in the eyes of everyone to the extent that he is given to be the manager. <laughs> he becomes the manager of the prison, of all the prisoners by the officer of the prison, meaning like, you know, he's the, anyway, in every situation in his life, Yosef had this idea, this word called chain, grace, chain. Yeah. Uh, to have chain, you have to be happy. That, that's a pre, apparently that's a prerequisite for chain. You have to be happy. So even in prison, he is happy. He believes that everything is, div is divine providence. The happiness in prison comes from the mother figure mm -hmm. because the inner dimension of motherhood is happiness. That's the meaning of the womb of a mother. Okay, so when the mother has, when a, when a mother is carrying a child, there's a there's an inner happiness, which is represented by the happiness that she feels, but it's also the child. Um, okay, so no, that's it. So his happiness in prison, uh, it, it was a trial. It, uh, his other trial was resisting Patifar's wife. Mm -hmm. uh, he was successful at that, at that trial and, mm -hmm. and, and the trial of being in prison for 12 years. So both of those trials. So if we were to state in one statement what Yosef represents, it's the power to reveal the depths of the unconscious into consciousness. So the 10 secrets of the soul, which, is the, which are the 10 secrets of, of the soul. So we will go through the different levels of the soul and how they are represented in the life of Yosef. Um, so, so after Yosef interpreted Pharaoh's dream mm -hmm. uh, with, a, with this genius interpretation, Pharaoh says, can we find such a man who possesses the spirit of God? Mm -hmm. That's an actual quote from the Pusik, from the, from the verse. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it continues, the spirit of God is in him. This is Pharaoh. So the, the wording is like this. It's like this. Ish Asher Ruach Elohim Bo. Right? Mm -hmm. so, so then Pharaoh follows Joseph's interpretation and his advice about appointing, uh, okay, and, and understanding to, about appointing a man of understanding uh, to manage the preparations for the upcoming famine. So Pharaoh appoints Joseph. And then Pharaoh says, Ein Navon. The Chacham Kamocha. How would you translate that? In in Navon? Yeah. Uh, there is not an understanding man. Uh, it says um, um, is, something like uh Ain no, no, uh Ain Kamocha and Ain Navon, not Navon, mm -hmm. a, a man of understanding, the Chacham and a wise and a wise man Kamocha, uh, like you. Uh, when uh yeah, uh, when Pharaoh expresses admiration for an appointment of Yosef, he, he observes, 
Yeah, there's no one as wise and skilled as you. Yeah. So then, then after that, Pharaoh gives Joseph a ring, mm -hmm. which gives Joseph the king's authority. Mm -hmm. And Joseph will determine uh, all the decisions made in Egypt from that point. Okay. Uh, Joseph went out to the people uh, after this, after he was appointed the viceroy, mm -hmm. and, and they called him a special name. They called him Avreich. You ever heard this before? Yeah, Avreich. Avreich usually, I mean, for what I know, Avreich is like the, you know, the guys who learn Avreichim, you know, the guys who learn in the... Uh, right, right. In the, the, the base Midrash with you, you know, the guys who got like, they're like the residents, so to speak. Resident teachers, resident Havrusas. They get, they get paid, these are the guys that get paid by the Kolo, Avreichim. So I think he's, gonna, he's actually going to say that now. He's going to say... Mm -hmm. Uh, so Joseph, uh, so Joseph went out after he was appointed viceroy to the people, and they called him his special name, uh, Avreich, just spelled Aleph Bet Reish Chaf Sofi, right? And uh, apparently, it means a patron. Okay. Nowadays, the word is used to refer to any young man that devotes himself to Torah study. Okay. So this this is the one and only time. We see this word used in the Torah. Mm -hmm. Rashi gives three meanings to this word. The first is father of king, mm -hmm. which means counselor. Mm -hmm. The second definition is Avreik. He splits Avreik into two words, which, which mean Av Rach, which means a soft father. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then uh, yeah, the Av part is connected to the idea of wisdom, like uh, like in the sphere of parts of Av. Okay, okay. Uh, one second, like in the sphere of parts of Abba is Chachma. And so Av, again, okay, so we have the 10th sphere, right? So the, the, the second sphere is Chachma, right? But it's also, there's another name for Chachma. It's also a part of, right? Which is Abba. Right, so this idea of Av, Abba, is is synonymous with Chachma. Okay, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. okay, so that's just a kind of like a sidebar. Okay, um, okay, and and the word soft means uh, soft in years, mm. a young person. Interesting. So this is what Rashi is saying. So the modern usage of Avreich comes from the second meaning, which is a young mm -hmm. Torah scholar. He's soft in years. Okay? He's, mm -hmm. Meaning like youth is related to the idea of, of soft and supple, right? It's, mm -hmm. and, and, and age is related to like, you know, something that kind of gets like calloused and kind of brittle. Yeah. So that's where these ideas come from. So soft in years, okay. So now the third meaning that Rashi uh, brings is uh, he focuses on the root, which is bet reish chaf. Yeah. This is barek, which means to bless, or it means a knee, you know, the knee. K-N-E-E, -E, the knee. Mm -hmm. so, so, so Yosef was a person that every knee in the country bended to him in mm -hmm. submission. Uh, so uh, the order in which Rashi brings these three definitions is important. The Baal Shem Tov taught that submission, separation, and sweetening, right? He, mm -hmm. he thought about these three different ideas and re related to each other. This teaching uh, corresponds to, uh, to, to, to Rashi, this teaching from the, from the Baal Shem Tov, but, it, but in reverse order. Mm -hmm. um, submission corresponds to bending the knee. Separation corresponds to being a soft father. Because mm -hmm. I'll say that the word soft Rach means, means young, as, as we said before. And, and as we mentioned earlier, Av means wisdom. So Joseph is young, but separated from other young people because they don't have his wisdom. Okay, So he is wise, but separated from the other wise people because they are usually older than him. So this fact about Joseph is describing him as he is himself. Uh, it, it does not refer to his job or function. So his function is to advise people on how to save their lives, to tell us how to save our lives. Reminds me of my brother. To save 
the lives of the whole world, not just, not just the land of Egypt. The famine extended to all of the ancient world. So Pharaoh was, was considered the leader of the whole world. And, and Joseph advised Pharaoh, thereby the whole world. So he advised the whole world how to navigate through hardship and bitterness. It, does that not sound like my brother? Anyway, so, so he helped to bring sweetening to a harsh decree. That's, that's uncanny. So in, in, in Yosef's attribute, hero, right? Uh, this idea of soft father, right? Avrech is connected to his Chachma sphera, his personal, his personal sphere of Chachma. After Avrech, uh, which, is, which is one of the names that people refer to Yosef, uh, Pharaoh gave Yosef a royal name. And this is the one we mentioned before, Safnat Paneach. Yeah. It's spelled Tzadik Pei Nun Tav, and then Pei Ayin Nun Tet. So to make him worthy, uh, to, to, he had to give him this title to, to make him worthy to marry, marry a royal woman. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, perhaps the greatest sage in the last century, whose uh, whose name is Yosef, right? He's talking about uh, uh, he's talking about the rugged mm -hmm. He wrote a book called Zofrat Paneach. Yeah. Right. So the famous rugged right? Yeah. Rugged gave the Lubavitcher Rebbe his smicha. Did you know that? Unbelievable. Yeah. Wow. I didn't know yeah. that. Hmm. So, so, uh, so Tzofnat means hidden hmm. or concealed. The essence of Joseph is to be able to reveal that what is hidden, yeah. to solve the riddles of the unconscious. Uh, Tzafon equals concealment, which yeah. I think it's also the word for north, right? If I'm not oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Paneach, Paneach mm -hmm. doesn't have a similar name in the whole in the whole bible we we had to guess what it means yeah. because there's an eye in there it sounds like something having to do with face but it but not in its root so then so uh, rabbi ginsburg says it means to solve to solve so paro so, so paro called yosef uh he called yosef this name because yosef interpreted paro's dreams so only joseph was able to interpret the dreams and none of Pharaoh's wise men were able to. So there is a phrase in, in Job, in the book of Yoiv, uh, in chapter 12, verse 22, quote, he uncovers deep things out of darkness, unquote, mm -hmm. and brings to light the shadow of death. Yeah. So, mi, uh, mi gole, uh, um, am, amigale amukot, mini hoshech, Okay, so which again is he uncovers deep things out of darkness and then continues and brings to light the shadow of death. Okay, so we said earlier that Joseph loved gematria. He loves adding, he loves math, he loves uh, playing with numbers. Okay, so the, the ultimate revelation of Joseph is Mashiach. Ben Yosef, right? We talk about that pretty often. And it's interesting because you don't hear Lubavitch, Lubavitchers speak of Mashiach ben Yosef too often. I was going to say that they just go right to David. Usually. Right. But, uh, but actually, uh, I think we're going to ask about this. Uh, Rabbi Wolf, mm -hmm. just about like two weeks ago, gave a, a three-part mega lecture on Mashiach ben Yosef. It's, it's unbelievable. I highly recommend it. Anyway, so, so back just quickly. So we, we knew even in physics that every tiny little particle mm -hmm. has an antiparticle, right? An electron mm -hmm. versus a positron, right? So, 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 uh, so these particles annihilate each other when they meet. So uh, with Mashiach, when it comes to Mashiach, who is the uh, antiparticle of Mashiach? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so there's a principle that in, in Gematria, every number has something very good about it and also very bad meaning there's a positive idea associated with it and also it's it's, it's opposite so so the bad is something is, is is a bad version of of the good thing okay so both 
Mm-hmm. So both Mashiach, right, and the Nachash have the same gematria. Okay, the same Nachash that that seduced Adam and Chava, Adam and Eve, just like just like the wife of Potiphar that tried to seduce Yosef. So when Yosef withstood the trial, he rectified in a great way. Uh, the, 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 he, he rectified Adam, you know, that whole situation with Adam. He, yeah. he played a huge role in rectifying what happened in Ghana, okay, with Adam, the first man. So the Arizal says that Yosef is, uh, he is, uh, he uses the word Zihara, splendor. I think that's Aramaic. Okay, he's Yosef is the splendor of Adam Harishal. That's what the Arizal says about Yosef. He withstood the trial that Adam couldn't withstand. Yosef was given this name, Tsofnat Panea, to solve the riddles of creation, to solve the riddles of the soul. So let's calculate now. So Tsofnat, Tadik Pe Nun Tav. That's 620. Right away, that's that, by the way, that's Gematria Keter. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then, and it's also the amount of letters that are found in the, uh, in, in the, in the, when the Ten Commandments are read, that whole section is made of 620 letters. Okay. So mm-hmm. uh, that's just side stuff. Okay. So again, Tsofnat is Gematria 620. Okay. And it represents con- the concealed mysteries of the subconscious. So this is completely analogous with Keter, right? 620. Mm-hmm. The, 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 the name of the sphera, the first sphera is Keter. And Keter, the, the gematria of that word Keter is also 620. So in the whole Torah, there are, there are 613 uh, mitzvot, and also there are seven mitzvahs enacted by the rabbis. Mm-hmm. Okay? But also, uh, corresponding to that and kind of overlapping, there are also seven mitzvahs b'nei Noach. Okay? Yeah. So you have, so in a sense, you have 613 mitzvahs for the Jewish people, and you have seven for mankind. Okay, so that that right there is 620. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so the mitzvahs derive from the superconscious of the spherot. Okay, the the tzofnat of the spherot. You could say so, mm-hmm. but the paneach, right? Um, we, we actually wouldn't know what it means without this context, but paneach, the, the, the word paneach is pei ayin nun het. That's gematria 208. That's also the gematria of Yitzhak. Okay. Mm-hmm. So this shows an explicit affinity between Yosef and Yitzhak. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and we mentioned a great tzaddik, the Rugachava, right? Yeah. Uh, he wrote a book called Tzofnat Panea, right? So, it, it, so in the revealed aspects of the Torah, he was uh, basically unrivaled. But, uh, but anyway, now we will discuss another tzaddik, actually probably next time, right? Uh, it, it, we will discuss another tzaddik in the concealed aspect of the Torah, uh, the Friedeke Rebbe, so, which, which his name is Yosef Yitzhak. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so what is the rationale behind Combining these two names together, uh, there is a direct relationship between Yosef and Yitzhak, and it's not just through Yaakov. Okay, so we can actually stop there because this is a very extensive. This is a. It, it took me 27, 28 page, 29 pages, yeah. 30. Actually, oh my God, I can't believe how long did it take me to do this? 31 pages. Oh my goodness. Huh. Okay. So all right, I wanna I wanna guys I wanna show you a different uh, you guys could one second show you a quick little I forgot I, I made this little graph to kind of just as a quick you know summary of some of the numbers we talked about. Okay. Um, Tell me if you see that clearly. Yes, I do. The whole thing? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So a person can freeze that if they want to. Mm-hmm. Take a look. 
Mm -hmm. If they so choose. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. So uh, that was a lot of math. That was a lot of concepts associated with numbers. But um Square. <laughs> we, we await something. We await something? Is that what you said? We await, yes. Yes, sir. I'm going to be participating in an event. I won't say where. Among friends, let's put it this way. Where we're going to be mahaziking a captive audience about, uh, in the words of Bill Cosby, some of the things that we were been talking about. Oh. Oh. We're talking about the Ponzi thing, the, thing, the uh, you know, 10 Sons of Haman, um, a lot of concepts, and they're gonna be rabbis there, who I know, and, uh, Actually, it's going to end up being on Tu B'Shvat. The venue to be announced? Venue, we know where the venue is, or I won't say. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a parlor meeting. Let's put it that way. A parlor meeting. Yes. Not a parlor. P-A-R-L-O-R. Par -L -O -R. Parlor. A parlor. Yes. Zat Hashem. What, what, pray tell, is the difference between a parlor and a parlor? I have no idea, but parlor is an app with an E. Oh, is that what it is? I thought it was a... Yeah, well, it was. And, you know, now... Now Getter is an app. Parlor got... Uh, turned into QAnon. Actually, I think they still, they're still alive. Mm -hmm. they're still alive uh, they have 20 million users I haven't used it in a long time uh, but uh, actually here parlor .com. Yeah. Par the, the way parlor is spelled is actually the way the French word par par parlay yes so, so speak yeah. parlay. I'm just curious where the word getter the I like get her done kind of thing like where yeah no i mean it's it's twitter mm. right twitter but get her mm. and get her sounds like get her and getting her means it sounds like get clinton <laughs> get <laughs> that's get what her. Get all her. of that is all of that is related that's very funny I'm get her users they have uh... oh but you know what get her really is mm. now do you recall the opening, one of the opening, not the opening scene, but the second scene in Ghostbusters when they get a, they get a report that there is a ghost in the New York City Public Library, mm -hmm. right? So they go to, they interview the, the actual librarian who saw the, the ghost. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and when they, they go downstairs and then they see the ghost flying there. And then they're like, so, so, so what do we do? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so then, it's a very funny scene. So then uh, Dan Aykroyd is like, okay, follow me. I know what to do, right? Mm -hmm. They're like approaching her and he goes, get her. <laughs> oh, that's and then that's, that's when the big scare, you know, when, yeah. when the ghost like, scares the hell out of them and they yeah. go running for their yeah. lives. Get her, that's where, that's where get her's from. That's funny. I'm looking for any kind of trace of anything that speaks about maybe uh, your brother making an appearance on Schmogen. Schmogen. And uh, Schmo, Schmo Jogen. Let's see. Uh, anytime. Let's see. Let's see. Anything? Anything? Bueller? Bueller? <laughs> anything? Anything? Uh, no, anything? nothing. Nothing as of yet. Nothing as of yet. Somebody's trying to, I told you, somebody, somebody on Getter, speaking of Getter, just trying to get your brother noticed by Rogan. Yeah. And, uh, 
Yeah, there, there you go. Uh, gateway Shmundit. Today. This is what I said to these idiots on Twitter. Zinc is the bullet. It kills the virus. The only problem is the bullet doesn't get to the place where it needs to be. This is what your brother said. Uh, uh, Shmelenko became a hero for his use of HCQ to fight Shmovit. Sadly, his efforts were halted by a Democrat governor. He didn't, but Shmelenko didn't stop. He kept working and found an over-the-counter way to help people. Watch, here's the da 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 bullet the gun approach, and there's a video. Zinc is the bullet, it kills the virus. The only problem is the bullet doesn't get to the place where it needs to be. The virus is inside the cell, the enzyme is inside the cell. And zinc on its own cannot get into the cell. You have a bullet without, you have a bullet without a gun, useless. Now it turns out there's a class of medications called zinc ionophores, or a class of substances called zinc ionophores. What they, what they do is they open up a channel, a door, which allows zinc to go from the outside the cell to inside the cell. There are four of them that ready, readily available. Two of them are prescription, two of them are over-the-counter. Two prescription ones are, as everyone heard of, HCQ and IVM. They're the guns that shoot the bullet. The bullet then gets into the cell, stops the virus enzyme from helping the virus replicate. So you have only the synergy of the two create a functioning unit. Uh, in April of last year, Shmomo, Issued a uh, Fredo issued an executive order that was directly targeting me and my patients because I was the only one in the state doing it, where pharmacies would not dispense HCQ to patients. So all of a sudden, I had a gun and a bullet approach, but he took away the zinc delivery system. At least he took away access to my patients. So I was forced by necessity to innovate. I did more research in an NIH servers of all places. I found papers paying a substance, saying a substance called quercetin as is a zinc delivery system as well as zinc. It's a zinc ionophore. To be honest, I never heard of quercetin, so I googled it and I see it's over the counter. Oh, so you can use, so why use HCQ? Of course, it's just not as effective or what? Of course it didn't. Why don't people just use quercetin? Why can't they just use quercetin? Instead of HCQ, why don't you just use quercetin? As the... Because uh, quercetin, well, you can look at it like this. So HCQ, you could, th you could think of it as a, as a 50, 50 cal BMG, mm. like, you know, Barrett 50 cal, you know, those like yeah. those really yeah, yeah, yeah. powerful rifles, right? Yeah. The round is like, I guess it's like a seven inch long. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, and quercetin, I should say schmercetin, right? Yeah, schmercetin. Schmercetin is, is like, uh, like an AR-15, still pretty darn good. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I mean that's you know that that's basically it. It's just it's just it's just weaker. But if you if you use more rounds, right, then you can have uh, a very comparable impact. Okay, so let's say you know with one round, fifty BMG, right? Uh, you you know it, it would take like you know a few magazines of an AR fifteen to do the same damage. Mm -hmm. Maybe a full magazine, maybe a magazine and a half. Okay, but that's still that's that's yeah. still pretty awesome. That's yeah. why that's why in the prophylaxis protocol, yeah. uh, the schmercetin is taken every day. Yeah. But meanwhile, uh, the the high the high schmoxy schmor schmin, right? Uh, yeah. That's taken once a week. Mm. And so is the so is the yeah. schmeiver schme schmectin. Yeah, once a week. I, I, you could say IBM. Yeah. So he and goes. Not, he's not as funny as Schmeier or Schmeck, though. <laughs> That's true. So yeah. what have I accomplished if I say, you know, IBM? Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah, your brother goes on. That was one of the most significant realizations in my life and probably humanity. Why do I say that? Because now there's a cure for tyranny. There are two risk factors for dying from Schmovid. It's a doctor you choose and the government you live under. Besides that, there's no reason a person should die from Schmovid. Now you don't need a doctor. Now you don't need permission from the government. You can go to a pharmacy, you go to a supermarket and buy over the counter option of quercetin together with Schmink C and D. Together, it creates a very powerful immune boosting nutritional supplement. According to the FDA, I'm not allowed to make any claims except that it's immune booster and nutritional supplement. So, what I'm going to say is the following Schmercetin C together from a functioning zinc ionophore, a zinc delivery system. Zinc is what it delivers. So, you actually need zinc as well. All you need is the gun and the bullet. Vitamin D. Da -da -da. So, he's talking about his whole, uh, what's it called, the Z, Z Schmack. Uh, doses, da, 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 yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's basically it. Yeah. It's crazy, man. It's crazy. Respiculous.
Pelosi blames Trump supporters for a murder committed by follower of Nation of Islam. What? Huh? Shmelosi. Nancy Shmelosi. Um. My God. Unbelievable. Oh, there you go. Real science doesn't force you to believe. It just shows you. Italian university students call out for help against Schmexine coercion and authoritarian regime. I'm just reading your headlines, whatever. It doesn't matter. Crazy. Yeah, so I'm looking at the same. Yeah. At the same page. It's, it's Dude, who's, who's Tim Pool? Tim Pool is the guy. He's, he's has a, he has a podcast. He, was, he made himself famous during the uh, Occupy Wall Street. And now he has a podcast. Actually, he's pretty fairly like normal guy uh, uh my god they're going into the fourth job psychos uh what are they what happened somebody swatted us the cops just walked in what the hell what wait hold on play this pandemics and there's only four cases of them that didn't result in a revolt or large-scale protest afterwards and they actually announced a number of times you know the cops just walked in yeah i don't know what's going on here uh should we uh yeah that i I, I was looking at my notes i was like somebody did somebody swat you yep somebody swatted us did they really yep somebody swatted us how do you know how do you know i have somebody texting me oh yeah so wow so Uh Yeah, just a police officer entered here, looked around, because it looks like someone swatted this live (laughs) broadcast here. Glad they didn't come in here busting, man. I'm glad, yeah, Yeah. man. I mean, that's that's something that's... Someone made ah. Someone made a fake police report that there was an active shooter at a studio. Two police officers burst into the pool studio, told them to receive a call that two people had been shot and killed. What the hell... So strange. My God, what, what's going on? Anyway, yeah. someone. Where where are the knickknacks when you need them? Huh? The knickknacks. Where are these knickknacks? Huh? I'm pissed at the knickknacks. Yeah. <laughs> knickknacks. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's like oh, I feel like I feel like Homer Simpson's that uh, you know the grandfather. Knickknacks. <laughs> Remember my army training. Uh, Remember that when he was like left by himself? He's like, yeah. no problem. I can do this. Remember your army training. Yeah. Um, so I don't know, man. The knickknacks pissing me off because they like to show up. They like to, you know, show themselves off to, you know, I have to become a I have to become a Navy pilot to see a knickknack, apparently. It's annoying. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, when's the big reveal? I don't know. Man. I don't know, but uh... remember that scene? I it's it's one of my favorite scenes to this day when um when Gozer finally Gozer. shows up. Yeah. Gozer the Gozerian. <laughs> and then and then uh You always go back to that guy, huh? Gozer. Yeah, so no, so so basically. You know, they, they were deciding, the Ghostbusters, like, before them, like, who's going to talk? Who's going to, what are they going to do? Like, somebody going to talk to her? <laughs> so, so Dan Aykroyd is like, goes to the Gozerian. I represent the city, county, state of New York. Stuff like that. Can you play that? Can I, can you please Another, play that? I'll play it. Wait, goes, what is it? This is like, uh, what scene is it? Okay. Uh, just, just type in, just uh, Ray Gozer. Just Ray Gozer. Let's see what happens. Goes was there a rise in NYC? This or no? Okay, so just okay. How about this? Ray orders Gozer. This? Yeah. Yes. Gozer the Gozerian. Good evening. As a duly designated representative of the city, county, and state of New York, I order you to cease any and all supernatural activity and return forthwith to your place of origin. Or to the nearest convenient parallel dimension. That ought to do it. Thanks very much, Ray. That, uh, what the hell? Oh, no, but that, but then, okay. So what happens is, immediately, uh, Gozer says, "Are you a god?" Right? And, 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 then, and then Ray goes, "No." 
then he's like, then die, and right? shoots lightning bolts, yeah. from, you know, whatever. Yeah. And then, you know, there's some kind of like, you know, so nondescript, like, you know, pain they're feeling, you know, yeah. not sure, it's not clear what's happening. And then after it's finished, mm -hmm. uh, Winston, the, yeah. the normal Ghostbuster, he's the only, it's yeah. interesting that the only normal Ghostbuster black is guy. black guy, right? So uh, he, was, he was the straight man in the movie. Everybody else was, was, was the goof, right? Yeah. So, so he goes, Ray, the next time someone, no, if someone ever asks you, are you a god? You say, yes. <laughs> That's funny. Can you play that too? Can you play that even though I just ruined it? Oh, yeah. By the way, you know who plays Gozer? Gozer, Gozer. It's a, it's a, it's a uh, like a Russian ballerina. A model, yeah. She's like it's a Slov uh, She looks Russian. Serbian actress and model, Slavica Jovan. That's what, exactly what Gozer looks like. Like yeah. somebody named Slavica Jovan. Yeah. Wait, what am I doing? Uh, 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 Ray. Okay, so okay, so, so let's go. Uh, are you a god? Yeah. Are you a god? Yeah. So if, he re if he replaces it, just let him just let him say it again. I could hear it like yeah. Here we go. Yeah, this is it. Okay. Let's play the whole. Let's play the whole thing. That's awesome. Come on, slow garbage. Use these ads. I can't take them. Try them inside. What? It's not letting you play it without like. Yeah, it's playing. It's playing. Yeah. Good evening. As a duly designated representative of the city, county, and state of New York, I order you to cease any and all supernatural activity and return forthwith to your place of origin or to the nearest convenient parallel dimension. That ought to do it. Thanks very much, Ray. Are you a god? <laughs> Like no. <laughs> no, so after she finishes zapping them, then that's when that's when uh that's when Winston says his famous line. And then, that's fun. Ray, when someone asks you if you're a god, you yeah. say yes. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, man, that's that's awesome. When, when is the neshama going to come back into movies? When is the neshama going to come back? When movies? you know when? When the neshama comes back? Yes. That that would be Mashiach. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. Movies will suck until Mashiach comes back. Yeah. And then and then we'll have either good movies or something or life will be or life will be a movie, the most amazing movie ever. Correct. All right, sir. We're on like three hour Correct Mundo. Yes. We're at the three hour mark and uh we are. Let's this get out. This is a very potent, potent episode. A lot of a lot of a lot of information jam packed. But to me, yeah. You know, what's your takeaway, man? What you take the takeaway take is that, in the words of that Russian restaurant song, "Все будет хорошо." Yeah, it does not. "Все будет хорошо" is a low-class Russian drinking song, <laughs> which I like. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Right. It's very simple. It's very simple. Yeah. yeah, but you know what I take away? Which what is amazing it? that had I not continued reading the lecture that, mm -hmm. I, that I was writing, right? Mm -hmm. Which you, which you rudely. Sorry. Hello. Oh. Hello. Yeah, I said rudely. What? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I was on mute again. I cut off for a second. You, you so what? rudely, rudely interrupted. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, had I not continued after being demoralized greatly, I wouldn't have discovered. That, that incredible idea where Yosef uh, was described as a young man who, mm -hmm. who uh, advised the world mm -hmm. as to how to survive mm -hmm. and the preparations, the things that they need to do to survive the famine, to mm 
this, which is a worldwide death event. Mm -hmm. uh, I see quite the parallel oh, yeah. between, between that and another young Jewish guy who uh, also is advising the world mm -hmm. on how to prepare and to avoid a, a worldwide death event. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. There's a parallel. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not saying anything more than that. I'm not trying to say he's Mashiach ben Yosef. Yeah. Okay. I already called him Mashiach. Yeah, and, and, and everybody lost their, in the words of Joker, everybody loses their mind. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they lost their minds. They lost their minds. As if they but, have any minds to lose. They didn't even have any minds to lose. They lost whatever. Again, you know, you know, again, just, just to say, you know, Mashiach ben Yosef, we talked about this, that uh, Mashiach ben Yosef can be an individual or he can be a cloud of individuals, right? He can, mm -hmm. he can kind of like morph back and forth like that to a, to a solid individual or basically Mashiach ben Yosef is whoever's doing the job of Mashiach ben Yosef. Anybody who's a ben Yosef. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does the job of Mashiach ben Yosef. That means if it's a. Hello? You cut off for a second there. Hello? So you're cutting out. As a. Dude, you're cutting out. I think, I think the Sitra Akhra doesn't want anybody to hear this. It's. Okay, I think we're being like attacked at the moment. That's unbelievable. Yep. That's unbelievable. All right. Could I, so. could I, could I quickly say it again? Yeah, say it again. In, in my brother's capacity, mm -hmm. as uh, as somebody who's advising the world mm -hmm. on on uh, how to avoid a worldwide death event, mm -hmm. in that capacity, he is Mashiach Ben Yosef. Anybody mm -hmm. who's involved in the job is part of Mashiach Ben Yosef. Okay, mm -hmm. certainly someone who is at the uh, what they say, he, my brother likes to say, which I actually hate this expression, the tip of the spear. I mm -hmm. hate that expression. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, someone who's, uh, you know, very uh, on the fountainhead, let's say, let's yeah. put it that way. Yeah. All right, we'll leave it at that. All right, sir. Shkoya. And. Uh... It's going to snow tomorrow. Well, uh, you're in Miami. What the hell am I talking about? So I'm probably going to be cooped up here for Shabbat. And, uh, we'll see you, know, you know, next time, just food for thought in between the next, you know. Um, let's think of, let's use uh, Ghostbusters as the metaphor. Well, who, mm -hmm. Who's the Ghostbusters? Who's Gozer? Who is Vince Clortho, key master of Gozer? And uh, let's see. Let's see what happens. Let's see what we can uh, come up. Already. With. All right. Yes, sir. Fantastic. All right, man. I'll talk to you. Take care. Yeah.